You're listening to the best, the bravest. Interviews with the FDNY's elite. The second of two milestones this week. Welcome back to the Mike the New Haven podcast. Tonight is episode 220. If you haven't checked out the previous episode, that was the first milestone, volume 30. We hit 30 volumes of Tales from the Boom Room, profiles of the NYPD's arson explosion and bomb squad. I started that miniseries last year on a whim, like I pretty much do everything with this podcast on a whim, and somehow it sticks, it works, and uh, we hit volume 30 uh, on Tuesday. It was with Detective Paul Pericone as we covered the 2016 Chelsea bombing. Paul worked that amongst many cases during his 18 years in the bomb squad, and he drove the show. That was a great hour, re-looking, or revisiting, I should say, that particular case. And tonight, another milestone. It is volume 30, of the best of the bravest interviews with the FDNY's elite. I've said this story before, but I'll say it again because it bears repeating. I was talking to so many cops, New York City cops, and that's great and all. I like doing that. And at some point I said to my brother-in-law, why am I not talking to the guys and the gals from the FDNY? I should be talking to firefighters. And thus the best of the bravest was born. Fat Daddy Ray Silly was the first guest. That was volume <laughs> one last year. And tonight for volume 30, we welcome my next guest. His plate was full in his firefighting career. There's a combined 22 years fighting fires in Washington, D.C. first, and then New York City. He came into the fire service, of course, in 1979 in D.C., battled blazes down there for three years, and then came home to the Big Apple to take a bite out of it in 1982. But for the next 19 years, he worked in environments both ghetto, which is a term of endearment, of course, and grandiose alike, Engine 82 in the South Bronx, Ladder 5 in Greenwich Village, amongst many other stops. And that for this milestone, Volume 30, of the best, the bravest interviews with the FTNY's elite, retired FTNY firefighter. Dan Potter. Dan, welcome. Steve. How are you? Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me on. I tell you, you got some gangbusters on the show, and uh, I'm re really impressed with the um, the people that have been on your show. So um, I'm glad to uh, plug along. <laughs> well, <laughs> Be thank part you. Of it. <laughs> thank you. You know what? Just I'm, one I'm... quick cor correction, Mike. Go I ahead. did 20, 20 years with FDNY. I'm very proud 20. of uh, did 20 years. I just made it, and uh, the doctor said, by that time, you got to go because of ah. and we'll get into it. But I did 20 years in the uh, New York City fire, three years in Washington D.C. So okay, so that was a, that yeah. was a twenty-three year career instead of a twenty. Yeah, yeah. If we yeah. want to count that, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that being said, let's get into the first question. I see some yeah. of you uh, firing questions away already, and I'll get to those questions. Who's that? Who are those people? Give me a break. Hey. Give me a chance. Yeah. <laughs> Gary Stadler's one of them. Mike Milner is the other one. Oh, Mike Milner. All right. All right. <laughs> He's like, where's the freaking book? Mike Milner wants. Oh, uh, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Yeah. We'll get yeah. to that. Mike. Sorry, tell Mike, that. sorry I had to cut him out, but uh, out of the book, but it's okay. We'll, we'll get to it. <laughs> you know, he only cried himself to sleep two week, twice this week. He'll yeah. 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 He'll be fine. So, so the it. first, first question is always an easy one, Dan. Uh, where'd yeah. you grow up? Yeah. That's so, um, but born in Canarsie back in the old sweet days, 1957, born in Canarsie. And then after a couple of years, my uh, my parents they moved to Long Island. Long Island was you know putting up all these developments and uh, houses and things like that. So I grew up in Brentwood. My my parents went out to Brentwood, Long Island, and uh, so I went up there. Went to, to school there, uh, graduate high school, and did you know my years out in uh, Brentwood, Long Island, which was nice. Brentwood was a nice blue collar town. Uh, we had the North Shore, and then we had the South Shore uh, with beaches. So we grew up, you know. I mean, there was a little bit of travel, but it was always nice to go to the beach. It was The beach was available. And um, yeah, Brown was very nice at the time. So I remember putting the Long Island Expressway in and uh, just building more and more. And God, I don't know. I, I know Mike lives out there, Milner. But, um, oh, it's so tough to get around out there. But um, So I'm off Long Island now. I live up in uh, northern Westchester County, Yorktown. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, some of these towns on Long Island, they have a heavy civil service presence. You got guys that are cops in the city that live out there, yeah. the firemen in the city that live out there. Was that the case with Brentwood when you were growing up? Yeah, well, uh, it was in the 60s when um, back then uh, firefighters and cops had to live in the city. And uh, in early 60s, they were through union arbitration. They were allowed to move out uh, to the boroughs, uh, outside of the boroughs. And so that's why you see a lot of people bailed out and they all went to Long Island. I mean, my parents bought their house out there for $13,000. It was a ranch house, nice postage stamp, you know, size property. It was a beautiful little town, curbs, you know, grass. You had your own little, um, you know, your, your own little place. And um, But $13,000, which, you know, to them was expensive, but uh, it was just people going out there and they were building these developments over these potato fields and everything else out there. So... Uh, 
yeah, it was conducive for them to move out there. And, um, you know, and that's why everybody bailed out. That's why you saw like civil service. And one guy, uh, one guy would tell one guy, I live in this town. One guy would tell this guy, I live in this town. Yeah, before you know it, all these guys that uh, they moved out to Long Island. So there were blocks and blocks of, in the Brentwood that were just predominantly firemen or, um, uh, or, or police officers. So, uh, you know, and then we'll mention it later on, but as we're talking about this, uh, we interviewed um, uh, Chief Downey's son, uh, Joe and Chuck, and their, their quick story was, was that they all moved out, the whole family, they were all living in a, uh, in a uh, brownstone, and uh, they all bought houses on the same block. So they thought that was normal back then when the whole family moved out. Anyway, so yeah, to your point, uh, it became, you know, where blue collar workers went out and were able to afford a, a you know, piece of property for themselves. And Downey, they, I think that family ended up moving out to Deer Park, as my chat points out. Yep. And I remember, I remember reading in uh, Joe Vigiano's obituary for some research from my emergency service unit miniseries. They were saying, <laughs> the New York Times was jokingly saying, we don't know what was in the water in Deer Park in the 1960s <laughs> and 1970s just because of how many of the guys and gals that grew up there yeah. went on into civil service. You know, it has yeah. an impression on you. If you, have, if you have family on the job, all right, that's enough of an impression as it is. But if you're just seeing it, every yeah. day by the guys and the gals living in your neighborhood. That's well, where the fire starts. You're insulated, right? right? You're insulated. You just know, you know, he had his whole family living out there. And, and you know, guys, I know, you know, through the other interviews, guys would tell this guy, and before, you know, you guys were buying houses near nearby each other. So, yeah, it pretty much, um, it just expanded after that. Guys uh, from civil service will move out to Long yeah. Island or even Westchester County at the time. They started moving up to Westchester and, and different places. Rockland yeah. County later on, too. Yeah, and, you know, it just it, it falls out, right, as it gets busy and the houses go up. Orange County then becomes more prevalent. Putnam County becomes a little bit more, uh, houses a little bit more affordable. So it's like a rolling effect at that point. But, you know, the funny thing was you could you could work in Manhattan, but you couldn't live in New Jersey. But you could live in Montauk Point, which was, you know, 120 miles away, but you couldn't live across the river. Right. So... And the reason why is because you have to follow the money, right? New York money, they want to stay in New York. They don't want to go up to New Jersey. Right. No, of course. And I, I yeah. think even back then, I mean, now they have guys that live in Connecticut. I know a few that live in Connecticut. <laughs> allegedly, allegedly. Allegedly. I've heard. I've heard. Yes. I don't know if that's true or not. Well, I'll tell you a quick story. I'll tell you one other quick one about that. There was a fireman who was in Ladder 38 that he bought a house in Connecticut. The street over from him was New York. It was New York. It was, it was right on that boundary line. And <laughs> so, so they came around and he said, look, you either move across the street or you have to resign or retire. So he had over 30 years. He did retire. But, yeah, uh, another fellow lived all the way up by in um, almost Ulster County. And he said, look, if you ever move, you have to move back into the county. They gave him a break. But the other guy, because he lived in Connecticut, they told him, either you move back to New York State or uh, you, you retire. And he, had a, he retired. So I'll ask, I mean, because one of the people brought it up in the chat, and it was Gary, 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 uh, Gary Stadler at the top. He asked, he wanted me to ask you about being a volunteer firefighter in Brentwood. So, I mean, you, that was your first foray initially, but, you know, so tell me about getting into that. What made you want to be a volley? Well, you, you want to know how I got interested in the fire department? Sure. And then we'll, we'll morph into that? Yeah. All right. So being a kid growing up on Long Island, um, my Uncle Jack, he was, he was actually my father's friend, but we always called him Uncle Jack out of respect. But he came out to my house. I guess I was eight, nine years old. And at the time, my, my mother was doing a big Italian dinner downstairs. And, you know, Jack was old. My grandmother was living with us. My grandmother was feeble. She had one leg. And so um, they said, well, we got to get grandma downstairs here. And, you know, when my father was looking, how are we going to get grandma downstairs? So Jack's wife says, well, Jack, we'll carry him down. Carry her down. And Jack's a fireman. And I, I just looked up and said, whoa, my first action hero, right? Everybody just stopped. Oh, Jack will carry her down. And he did. And I just said, a fireman like that? And just everybody just stood, stood back. I said, that, so that kind of resonated. Then when my grandmother passed away, we had the, the funeral back in Canarsie. And at the time, then uh, up the street was 257 and ladder 170. And they were responding by. And Jack was just explaining how he was a fireman and stuff like that. So I, at that time, I was 10 years old. So I said, oh, this is really pretty quite interesting. And so... um. Then I guess I was about 12, 13 years old, and I was starting to get the buggy. Jack would come out and say, bring me some magazines, bring me some magazines. 
And um, so we visited Jack. Jack lived in, uh, Jack passed away, but Jack lived in Harrison, New York. So we were up there one day, my family, and there was a fire down the block from him. So uh, he's looking down, naturally, like a fireman, he looked down the block. And he says, uh, you're a fireman, right, uh, Uncle Jack? He goes, yeah. I said, then how come you're not down there? He goes, well, I work for the city. I'm a city fireman. I said, oh, what's the difference? He says, get your dad, and we'll go in the car. So this was like 1970, and he takes me down to Engine 82, Ladder 31, okay? And they have a fire going on. Hold, we put, put the fire. So now I'm looking at the, street, the streets. And I'm in the Bronx, and this is like, wow, this is a whole different world for me. This is, I love the, you know, what I'm seeing. And he takes me up, and there's the apparatus. They're all working. The apparatus is running. They got the hose lines. They, they got a fire in a frame up on Ho and Jennings up, up that way. And uh, Jack's introducing, you know, us to all. And we're right inside the fire lines, right? Everybody's out around. And, and so, um, he goes, oh, the truck's going to go back. He's going back in a minute. Get up in the front seat of the truck. So I go in the front seat of Ladder 31, and I sit there next to the, the legendary uh, Jerry Albert, and I forgot, I didn't know who the boss was at the time. And he took me back to the firehouse, and from there I was hooked, right? So now I'm back in Brentwood, and they start a junior fire department program. You have to be 14, but I'm 13, but the guys see I'm so much into it. And anyway, I join, and so I, got, I do... Uh, until I'm 18 years old, 13, 18, five years in a junior fire department. I'm hanging out in the Brentwood Fire Department, the volunteers. Um, and then I joined the Brentwood Fire Department. And at the time, um, we we were all, the engine companies were very busy. And at the time, Brentwood had a couple seedy spots that was a lot of fire activity. Uh, and you can you can always count, if, if, if nothing was going on, um, there was always brush fires in Brentwood. So there was always runs, there was always activity. But there were certain areas that we were getting all these house fires all the time because the area was a little, little dicey. And, um, and so <clears throat> I joined the Hook and Ladder Company uh, there were, with a couple of friends. There was about four of us. And we all joined the Hook and Ladder Company because they weren't even getting out that much, but they were going to every fire if they could get to them. And we turned the company around at that time. We turned the company where the truck was getting out all the time, and it was just us four guys, us all 18-year-old guys, the only one of the older guys came and drove the truck, we were going to these fires. And I mean car fires. And fire. Brentwood Fire District is the size of Manhattan. So it's just a big area. Yeah, it's the biggest school district uh, in, on Long Island <clears throat> and one of the largest fire districts and one of the busiest fire departments, if not the busiest fire department on Long Island. And they, so they were all surrounding engine company, but only one hook and ladder company. So we morphed that into a rescue company. We were also one of the first uh, fire departments on Long Island to get a hearse tool because we had the expressway and the parkway. So we were doing a lot of pin jobs out there. So I got to use the hearse tool, you know, when they were introduced at the time. But it was a great for us to get in there. And then we wanted, you know, we decided, you know, we need to go a little bit further. We want to make careers out of this. So this leads me into my dad. Mm -hmm. And one day I go downstairs in my basement. And if I'm talking too much, Mike, just no, this pull is, my mic. This is your story. Go ahead. You just, just pull my mic. Just blank me out. <laughs> no, you're fine. Go ahead. I don't All want right. to be talking. <laughs> so, so um, I guess I'm about uh, 16, 17. And my dad takes me in the basement. He's got, you know, electrical box. My dad's an electrician for Local 25. And he's got these electrical boxes all rigged up along the work, workbench. And he's going to show me how to wire these things. I go, all right. And, uh, you know, I, could, I said, where are we going with this, Dad? And he goes, well, I'm going to get you an old you know, the electric union. I says, I don't want, I don't want to go to electric union. He goes, well, what do you want to do? I says, I want to be a fireman. I want to be like Uncle Jack. I want to be a fireman. He goes, uh, best advice I ever got, Mike. He says, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And I said, I said, okay. I said, and then a bell rang on my head. So I met my friend, my, uh, my friends uh, in the, in the fire department with Bob McLaughlin, Phil Buffer, Mike Morris, and myself, we called ourselves the Fab Four, right? So what we decided to do, we coordinated, you want to know, we started writing to different fire departments for tests when they're going to have hiring tests, hiring exams. And then we started going to these different places. So I took the test in New Haven. I was supposed to get hired in New Haven uh, mm -hmm. back in um, 1978. Uh, but I took tests from Cleveland, Philadelphia. I took probably about 10 tests, all different places. With these guys, you know, we all, whatever we'll go to. But um, we said, you know, that's what we want to do. We want to be firemen. So let's not put all our eggs in one basket. 
And that's what we did. That was the best advice my father ever had. So uh, consequently, <clears throat> all four of us from Brentwood, including myself, we all got hired in Washington, D.C. at the, almost the same time, almost six months apart. Two and two from two first class, myself and Phil, we went in the second class at a Washington, D.C. fire department. And, um, you know, it was just a great career. And I was three years down there, but it was a great career. It was a fun career. But, yeah, so that's how I kind of got into the fire department. And, and I always said this, you know, there has to be like a mentor in your life that kind of leads you to d give you direction. It was happened to be my, my dad giving me that that little gem, you know, don't put the eggs in one basket. And then the second part, having my Uncle Jack. If, if it wasn't for him, I might be an electrician right now. <laughs> Which is yeah. not a bad career. It's not a bad my guess who got guess who got became an electrician? Who? My my younger brother. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad needed. my dad my dad worked. Oh I, it was it, I mean, we were very blessed to have my father work, you know, electrician and you know, right. we were very, we, he, he worked hard and we had a, you know, a nice, a nice, a good life, you know, a rewarding life. And he had a rewarding life than what he did. He, he loved what he did. So, yeah. So. This is, this is volume 30 of the best of the bravest interviews with the FDNY as the leading guest for this milestone volume 30 is Dan Potter. If you have any more questions in the chat, make sure you fire it away and I'll get to it at the proper time, of course. So <laughs> before I get to 82, year of 1982, that is, and coming back home, Every major city across America has its distinctive trait that makes it, well, the city that it is. You look at Los Angeles, you look at Chicago, Dallas, Texas, uh, obviously Washington, D.C. and New York City. You know, they have their distinctive characteristics. What was the main characteristic that you saw in those three years in D.C. that made D.C., well, D.C.? Oh, think of it. Nation's capital, right? So where I worked, I worked up in the upper northwest area of Washington, D.C., but you know, through, through details and and, and uh, moving around a little bit, it was it was pretty wild, Mike. When you um drove down a block and you saw the Capitol, mm -hmm. and then you saw the Capitol lit up, right? This was beautiful to see. You know, this is the center of government. This is where all everything happens over here. And then you drive down, all of a sudden you drive past the uh, White House. So there, there were you know these places, and you know traveling up and down Constitution Avenue. I was in a parade up down Constitution Avenue. I've been on parades on Fifth Avenue, but going down Constitution Avenue, um, it's so it's so historic. You're seeing the monuments there and the different places. But if you just saw, have you ever been, ever been to Washington D.C., Mike? No. So in video games, yes. In real life, no. <laughs> okay, it's a worthwhile of a trip. But when you see that, it's so it's, it's like when you used to see the tra the uh, the Twin Towers, right? The, the World right. Trade Center. You know, you see you get, you get the feeling. But when you see the Capitol lit up. Beautiful capital, big white, brilliant white building. You say, "Wow, that's where it all happens down there." So it's you know, it's pretty pr pretty different. I mean, than any other any other city. So I was so fortunate that I worked down there for uh, for that time. It's a heck of a place to start. And that being said, I guess it leads into one of the uh, notable things he did down there because Gary Stadler, man, you're on fire tonight, Gary. I appreciate the question. And it's Stu, I see your question and I'll, and I'll get to it in due time as well, buddy. Good to see you as well. There was a scaling ladder rescue made while you were yeah. down there. Why don't you tell that story? Yeah. So um, I was in Engine 21, which was up in the northern area of, uh, of uh, Washington, D.C. And, you know, typical night. And then we, we got a, a, a box alarm. So the box alarms were interested in, in Washington as they, um, they send four engines and two ladder trucks, right? And then a rescue truck. But each engine company has two pieces. So you have almost eight fire engines responding to a box and then two ladder trucks responding to to the box. So, I mean, it's like a parade of fire equipment that's that's responding. Um, and so what happened was we had the uh, engine 21. We, got, we, we were second due to a box alarm on 17th Street. Now the first engine and the third engine, they go to the front of the building. And the second and fourth two engines, because it's all alleyways, they go to the, they go to the back, they go to the rear. Um, and so when we pulled up in the rear, naturally I was going to stretch the hose line, and right above us, about the four four stories up, is a woman, and she's uh, she's screaming, she's screaming in the apartment because there's a little smoke coming out, she's screaming in the apartment, and I look, I have the hose line, there's nothing I can do. I just said, well, I said, you know, somebody's going to have to go get her. I said, I got the hose line. And with that, a fellow from ladder three from the from the front of the building, he comes running around. And the scaling ladder is a uh, long straw, uh, single pole. 
that 16 foot long has a big hook on the end and then rungs that come out, right? Almost like when you see a telephone pole, they have their rungs coming out. And he's pulling this around his, his back. He's pulling it around the corner. And there's a 35 foot ladder that's up to the third floor window. So he, uh, it's, it's underneath her. There's another floor above it, you know, and that's what, so that ladder's kind of short. So as he comes running around with the, uh, with the, the scale ladder, he starts climbing a climbing a thirty five foot ladder, and the um, the my boss or the engineer says, "Is you better give me a hand with that? It looks like it's kind of cumbersome." So as he climbs up, I grab it. I grab the uh, he's got the top of it, and I grab the uh, the bottom of the the scaling ladder, and we both in tandem we we climb up to the thirty five foot ladder, and to the woman that's screaming up apart. So the fellow that's on top, he takes the ladder and he hooks it up into the fourth floor window and he proceeds to climb up the ladder and I get to the position and I start climbing the ladder up to the window. Now, most of these, anytime you have these scale ladder rescues, most of the time, all you have to do is get up there and tell the, the person, tell the, the woman or the, the victim, just relax. We'll wait till the fog gets knocked down and we'll take you out, you know, through the stairs or something like that. <clears throat> but as he climbed to the apartment and I came up to the windowsill, she come flying out. She almost took my head off the way she come flying out. There was no convincing her that she was going to stay in that apartment. And so when she did, she her leg, she almost she almost knocked me off the ladder. But I I put a position around the ladder. Now the rungs only stick out so far. And this was a rather large woman. So again, when you do these they, they do do these scaling scaling ladder training normally in gym clothes or you have just like workout clothes and you know, for practice in, 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 the, in the proby schools and stuff like that. But I'm in full turnout gear. I have boots on. I have my helmet on. And um, now I'm trying to reach around this woman to grab these little pegs, these little these footholds and, and around her like that. And so uh, and I take it down step by step all the way down, you know, to the third floor. There's no net below me. And I'm just hanging on by my, my fingertips. And as we get down kind of to the uh, third floor, I'm thinking like, you know, put on a ladder. I, and then I just, I'm kicking the window in. And it was big enough window. So I kicked the screen in. It was a screen window. And then we kind of, you know, put the put the woman in there. So, yeah, that was, um, I, I've never heard of anybody. And I'm, I'm not boasting. I'm not blowing my horn. But um, I've never heard of anybody that brought anybody down. It's, it's a tricky procedure, <laughs> just going up and down yourself. But uh, I brought her down. And, um I got it, and I didn't think nothing of it. I just like that was part of my job, and then I went back to uh, to, the, to the firehouse, and you know, I mean, put the we did whatever we had to do at the fire, and so yeah, um, I got a scale ladder rescue underneath my belt. So, Darren Phillips in the chat says somebody actually used the scaling ladder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I like that. I mean, uh, you know, we trained on it in Washington D.C. We, we what we did is uh, we had we used to race with it. And that's that was part of you race hooking into the window, climb up, hook it up, and and so you, you your confidence was was you know built up with that. So I mean, I really had no problem really, you know, climbing up from third foot to floor. But taking it down, that was a little bit of a challenge. But um, I got into the window. I just said okay, and I thought enough that in the next morning, the guy that carried the hat, he was all on the, the local TV. I was home eating pancakes. <laughs> And uh, I, mean, I see him on all these local channels, what he did. I said, oh, God bless you. All right. Hey, listen, you know, the real guy's right here just saying, you know, but hey, no, no, as long no. as the job got done. Right? He thought it, he did it. I mean, he thought it, thought the job out. He thought he carried it. And he had the, he had the uh, you know, the idea of doing it. So I, all glorious is, you know, I, I was glad it was help. I was glad it was part of that. There you go. And then, you know, comes the summer of 82, getting back into yeah. the city, getting back at the FDNY, because during the 70s, for both the NYPD and the FDNY, there was the, and, and the other police departments too at the time, transit and housing, there was the hiring crisis, the hiring freeze as a result of the fiscal yeah. crisis. Guys were getting laid off, and guys that were on the job had to go be bus drivers and do different things. Now you're coming out on the other side of that. Guys are coming back, and now those that previously could not get on, get on. Now you had taken a lot of tests, and so you, you had loved working in D.C., and even though obviously in your heart, I'm sure you wanted to come back to the city. You were there for three years. You were, as you said, you were learning to really love it down there. Was there part of you that was conflicted? And even though this is a great opportunity, it's the FDNY, man, I kind of like it down here. 
No. <laughs> Simple as that. <laughs> well, look, no, I mean, no, I, I, I really, I really had a great time. It was like three years. I had a great time down there. But look, I grew up in New York, live in New York, love New York. I love New York City. Um, right. I was just fortunate that out of the four of us, I was one of the one of the guys that passed the test. Um, the other three guys stayed down in Washington D.C. They loved it down there. One guy became a uh, a beloved deputy chief. Another guy won the Firehouse uh, Rescue Award, um, and the other guy became a lieutenant. So they all had marvelous careers. Then. But um, I, I came back to New York because, you know, of course, family's back here. Um, and I love New York City. I was, I just used to love, you know, going to Canarsie and, uh, you know, going to take trips into the city, stuff like that. But my heart, my heart's always been in the city. So um, I, I was, you know, and, and they almost passed me over, actually, because um, – they started hiring. They started hiring guys, and uh, uh, another firefighter named Billy Lawson. He was down in Washington D.C. He's a great fireman, seventeen truck. Uh, he was returning. He was a little bit ahead of me in the next class. And he says, "Yeah, they're hiring again up in New York." I said, "Oh, they said, uh, let me call you know you, your investigator." So I called my investigator. He says, "Oh, he says he says I noticed you were firemen in Washington D.C. He says I figured you were happy down there." I says. He says, you know, do me any favors, you know. He says, I, I'm looking to come back. I would like to come back. And, uh, you know, I mean, my heart has always been FDNY. So right, I, I came back in, uh, I get back in uh, August of 1982. Funny thing is, I got hired in Washington, D.C. on August 6th, 1979. I got hired FDNY August 6th, 1982. And I resigned from Washington, D.C., Fire Department, August 6, 1982. Wow. And then if you want to, and then you want to add 20 years to that, I retired August 6, 2002. Wow. So it all yeah. went together. All those so August 6 is my magic date. Yeah. It would appear so. It would yeah. appear so. Yeah. This is volume 30, like I said, of the best of the bravest interviews with the FTNY's elite retired FTNY fireman and uh, soon to be author Dan Potter is the uh, guest of honor tonight. So happy to have Dan uh, with us. So, you know, that, during that time, it's interesting. I remember talking about it with Hank Molay last year, who was, you know, the old nickname with Hank, Molly the Volley, right? Uh, because he was a volunteer fireman too before he we came all out. We all were. And they, the best fireman came out there with volunteers too. Right. I mean, yeah. you not only did you have that experience, but you had the experience of those three years down in D.C., but still, guys yeah. don't mention it because it's like, you know, the mentality oh, amongst no. the guys that are up in the ranks are, no. okay, that's great that you did that, Right. That's the D.C. way or that's the Valley way. Now we're going to show you the New York City way, kid. So tell me about that. Well, that's it. See, you just you just I just hit a, a so in probably school. Now, naturally, I don't say nothing. I, you know, I don't say I'm from Washington, D.C., but but guys look and they see and they see your record or whatever like that. Anyway, nobody says anything. But I, so I go to probably school. And one of the parts of probably school is you have to slide. They have an outdoor pole where you slide. You know, you go up the steps. To like a second floor, and you slide a pole, and it's outside. So I go out and I walk the step, boop, slide the pole. And the instructor goes, Potter, this is not the way we do it in New York. Maybe they do it in DC. Do it again. Well, I had to do it again in front of my squad, maybe about 12, 13 times. So my legs were almost uh, rubber. And he just kept sorry, cycling me. I don't know how we got to know. I never saw, I never told anybody I was a DC fireman, but he knew. And, uh, but it was good. It was a, it was a giggle. So they, people know. Don't don't be surprised. <laughs> people know. They find out. And you know what it is? Telephone, telegraph, telefireman. It all exactly. works the same way. Exactly. It same thing works. with Tim Brown. Because Tim Brown, he was telling me he started out in Connecticut. He was a fireman yeah. here in Connecticut for a little yeah. bit. I think in Newington. And he yeah. came down to the FDNY. And same thing. He did not tell a soul, no. but he got out. They get they out. out. So they, they look at the records. They see the records. Right. and say, hey, oh, you got to, you know. People know. You're, you're, people know before you even get to the firehouse who you are and what you're about. Believe me. It's, right. it works or it like gets that. around. Or it gets, or around. it gets around. Tell a fireman. Forget about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Faster than a car being driven by Mario Andretti in his prime. I'll or tell you what. Prime. It's like a flash. It's got like a, like a good shot. It's out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So those first six years, you split it four years with Engine 88 and then those two years across the floor yeah. in 38. Now, you know, this is a time in which there's still a lot of work to be yeah. done. There's a public health crisis going on. That's the AIDS epidemic, and you're doing a lot of medical runs, I imagine, during this time, to certain areas more than others, with residents more affected uh, than uh, other neighborhoods in the five boroughs. 
So it's just such a bit, like I said, a busy era. But even then, although you're not happy these things are happening, it had to feel like Camelot. You're in New York City and you're in a busy place. You don't have to start off in a slow place and say, you know what, I got to go to a busier company. They landed right in the, well, there I say, no pun intended, right in the head, throws of the fire. I did. Uh, the um, the age part wasn't too much about it. We we were still doing the, um, the you know, a lot of false alarms. I remember the one night doing 30, 30 false alarms before midnight. Just you just getting on the rig and going back and forth. There were three boxes. Somebody was playing and pulling these boxes. But yeah, there was still a lot of vacants. When we used to ride down uh, by Vice, Vice Avenue, Daly, Honeywell, they were all, the streets were still abandoned. And they, they had these all these big H projects, uh, H apartment houses. So you're always kind of guaranteed that you're going to get a vacant building fire. And that's where you really learn your your craft, right? Because um, the senior guys will, will give you the nozzle. And so I'll tell you the quick first first example that I learned. And this is different firefighting that it's not done anymore. So um, I work with this. His name is Timmy Gallagher. And he's referred to as Tough Timmy Gallagher. And he's the Billy Martin of the Bronx. He's, he's, he's fiery like Billy Martin. He'll do he'll poke you. He, he he plays hockey. He parachutes. He just he just uh, he's an Irish gruff guy, uh, and, and um, he's he's got a reputation of tough Timmy. And if he don't like you, you are dead meat. So I get assigned to his groups. And at the time, he was a medical lead because he made a rescue, a, a hairy rescue of a uh, of a woman that was, had special needs, uh, mental special needs, and she ran. Uh, she was in the fire. He grabbed her, pulled her out. He got severely burned, and they, they put her on the floor, and she ran back into the fire, and he ran after her again and got burns on top of his burns. He was that's, he was a tough nut. But anyway, he's on medical leave, and so when I get to the firehouse, they're like, oh, you're going to work with tough Timmy Gallagher. He's going to eat you alive. So this is what I learned for, for three, four weeks in the fires. I'm cleaning the tools. I'm trying to be good, and and um, when he comes in, he goes, hey. Oh, he, after the fourth week, I'm going to meet him now. He goes, um, I heard about you. Come on up to my office. And, Mike, we hit it off. We become the best buddies in the world like that. I said, I said this is going to be, you know. So, anyway, we're going to the fires now. He's a, he's a no-mask policy guy. You don't wear your mask. Don't wear your mask. I don't want to see you wearing a mask. And I'm like, I said, okay, I'm going to learn. To, if I die, I die. I, I'm just at that attitude. I says. I'm going to learn from the best of these guys. And so when we had a big fall, we had a, a, one of those apartment houses on, on, um, over by Daly. And uh, Engine 45, a great, great engine company, you know, their first do over there. So what they do is they pull the hose in. And what we have is four um, floors of fire all the way through. You need like six windows of, of, of going, right? So before the towel ladder is even set up, what we're doing is we run the lines in, right? And so Angel 45 has the first line on the first floor. And then we go to the second floor. And we, we operate above them as we, everybody moves in putting the fire out together. But no mask. And so tough Timmy's up there. And he's standing. I can, I'm on the floor. And I'm sucking up. You know, you imagine these vacant buildings. They got all these old plaster and dust on the floor and dirt and stuff. And my it's all coming down, coming apart. Yeah, but my well, I mean, it's just because of all it's all an old building, right? It's been right. vacant for how many years? But my Absolutely. nose is in the cracks. So <laughs> and I'm watching the senior man and tough Timmy walking down. All I can see is above them, just above their ankles. And I could see him. I'm following him in the you know, cross. I said, I die, I die. But the, the guy that had the nozzle at the time was uh, Jimmy Sedaris. And his shoe, he wasn't wearing boots. His shoe, he has a navy shoe, catches on fire. The shoe catches all fine. <laughs> but he moves down. And now as we come out, now engine 45 is going to the third floor. And now we're, we're going to go to the fourth floor to put the fire out. And now this time I have the nozzle, you know, with tough Timmy. And he just moves me along. Come on, you got it. Come one more foot. One more. So that was, we call that leapfrog. And that's not done anymore because we had all those, those vacant building fires. And that's what these guys used to do before the towel ladder would even set up. So that's, that's a, um, that's a tactic that's not even used in the department. But that's how I learned. I learned no mask. And whenever I was working with him, I did not. I said, I, I go, I go. I said, but I didn't want to lose his respect any, in any way. I wanted to be his guy. And um, I became his guy. Uh, I, I, um, 
I, I worked in his groups, and then um, then he found out that I'm able to drive the engine because down in Washington D.C., part of your your probe school is you you come out as an engine company chauffeur. You you come out qualified to drive your apparatus. Unlike in New York City, New York City you have to go back to you know to the to the training academy to be trained. But Washington D.C., you you train to drive and pump uh, work the pumps. So when I went to 88, and now I've got six months on the job, seven months, he goes, uh, you can drive? You can, you can pump? I says, I can. He goes, that's it. That's it. So the one guy that was the regular chauffeur, now he's the union delegate. Now he's got to run. Also now, he sees the green light. Oh, I can go here. I can do. He runs out of fire to do whatever he has to do with his project, and I'm driving him. So I'm driving tough Timmy Gallagher with guys on the back step behind me with over 20 years. So there's guys like with 80, 80 years combined, and I got six months on the truck, but I'm driving the American La France engine, you know, with the boss, tough Timmy Gallagher, right beside me. So uh, you want a good story about him? Sure, go ahead. Okay. So this one time I'm driving him, and this is this is how this is character. And we're up on Southern Boulevard by uh, by Fordham Road. It's a it's a, you know, I drive him, it's a false alarm box, and we go up there and wind the box. Now the American La France apparatus, they're they're slow. They're not like the Max. The Max you can almost do a peel out with them. You can almost do a do a shot peel out shot. But oh, yeah. but driving these up, they're like campers. They're like Winnebago campers, right? But anyway, the next furthest box from us, the furthest box of us, is Monterey and One Eight O Street, which is all the way down, you know, um, Southern Boulevard and all the way across the Hundred Eighty Two. So now he goes, let's go, let's go. And I'm driving him down Southern Boulevard, and I'm trying to pick up speed. And I don't even hit the brakes. I turn on 180 Street, like that. But there's cars in front of us. But now we're first due at that box, right? It's a notorious false alarm box. But he's going, but he's going you know, okay, let's go, let's go. So all the way down the other end, off of 3rd Avenue, you see engine 46 turn on the corner. And he's looking at me. He's like, don't let them beat you into the box. And he's yelling at me on the front seat. And I'm driving. I got six, seven months on the job, right? And he's now he's leaning forward. He says, and he's looking at me. He says, Don't let them beat you into that box. Don't let them. And he's we have handsets. And now he's hitting me with the handset on my shoulder. Don't let them beat you. He says, ram them. I want you to ram them. And now I'm thinking, okay, I want to be his guy. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to get him mad at me. I said, so where do I hit this? Where do I hit this? I'm thinking in my head, where, while I'm driving around traffic. Why don't we hit this rig in the back? Should I hit him? Should I glance over? Should I hit the bumper? I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, engine engine 46 gives a false alarm, 1092. I go, oh, I'm like, oh, like this. And so he looks at me and goes, you're going to ram him, aren't you? I says, when you? When you, Cap? So I was his boy. That was the relationship we had all the time. I love him. He passed on some years ago, but I couldn't. I Mike, I grew up with the best of the best in the fire department, and he had to be one of the. He had to be the best, and your boss, you know. And I, there are all the there are the Timmy Gallagher's out there. If you were lucky or fortunate to work with a Timmy Gallagher, you learn how to firefight, and I learned how to firefight from him. I was really blessed with him. So yeah, that was a good good time in the engine eighty eight with him. I was I was lucky. You just you love guys like that, especially the bosses like that, because. Yeah. You know, I have a friend of mine that coins the term common sense bosses. You get so much done. And yeah. you could tell they love what they do. And, and when they love what they do, they spread that love right down to you guys, oh. you know, that are working under. And it's great. It's Camelot. Yeah. He just wanted to go to fires. Let's go. Yeah. Let's go. And that was, and he was in the 60s. But he didn't miss a beat. He just wanted to go to fires and, and the more the merrier. And, and he was hardcore. Again, and you hear these stories, you know, we're in a vacant building and the vacant, you know, framed buildings were built, designed to hold all the buildings together. We're in a frame that's by itself, so it's pre very prevalent to collapse and, and the whole fire is in the back of it. And uh, the chief's like, get out, get out, it's an empty frame. He'll do, he's like, I'll be right out, I'll be right out. We're not leaving that fire. We're not leaving that fire until it goes out. And if it collapses, so be it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that that's the mentality. The toughness. It's not just the physical toughness; it's the mental toughness was, too. Which in a job like that, you need. That's a, he was he was just solid like that. He was a, he was a great boss, you know. So mm -hmm. so I was very lucky like that. So I did four years in Engine eighty eight. Um, then I transferred <laughs> over to Ladder thirty eight, mm -hmm. uh, and then Ladder thirty eight is where my uncle Jack was. So <clears throat> he got me to Engine eighty eight when uh, 
you know, when I got on the fire department and you, you know, he told me you're going to come with me when you, when you get hired. I was very fortunate, very lucky like that. And so I went to engine 88 and then after four years, um, I transferred over to ladder 38. And so my milestone was working with Jack at some fires now. Right. And so, I mean, back then as a kid, I used to go to 8231 before Dennis wrote the book report from engine 82. So I used to spend years, years there. I would go, Jack would take me to the firehouse, um, 8231. Um, every time I got off from spring recess from high school or, or the summer, you know, summer uh, recess, I have, I go to the firehouse and I would spend the days in the firehouse, 8231. And, uh, I just loved it. I loved, you know, working with him, uh, not working with him, but, you know, riding with him and, and seeing the guys. And that's where I got, you know, again, you're asking me if, how I wanted to go back to New York. Mm-hmm. I experienced it firsthand. I saw, I saw what was going on in the kitchens of, of uh, 82 and 31 and, and how that firehouse operated and, and, the, and the guys. And uh, back then during the day, uh, you know, this is when Dennis was, he, there was a rumor that Dennis was writing a book. So it wasn't even out yet. But every run, I would sit in the front seat with Bob Farrell and Charlie McCarthy, all these legends that we now know. And um, they would go to one fire, one fire after the other, things like that. But they would come out and they had these huge smiles. And they'd come back in the kitchen and they would laugh, or they would go downstairs and they would laugh. And I just said, I gotta be part of this. So that's, you know, when you ask me about coming back to New York, that was in the back of my mind. I, I this is what I wanna do. But yet, so now I, when I get hired again with uh, Engine 88, Jack's up there. Jack's in the, the ladder 38. And um, he says, No, you, you come into my forest. We're, we're gonna work together. So when I transferred to ladder 38, I went to working with Jack. So that was a huge milestone from going from a 13 year old boy to, to now a 14 year old man. <laughs> but uh, coming but, in age. Yeah, yeah. You know, but now now I'm working with Uncle Jack. He's my boss. He's he signs me. He's the first time I get signed to the roof as a as a firefighter. And um Ladder 30 is all senior guys. They're all um they're all, they get all, all over 20 years and they're all senior guys. So they, they signed me to the roof. They said, you know, Jack, Jack, trust me, says, uh, you know how to do the roof, what to look for, what you want to do up in the roof and so on and so forth. I said, uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I said, no, I can handle it. I, I'm ready to do it. He goes, okay, you got the roof tonight. So working with him, that was a, uh, that was a, a, a huge milestone. Second milestone is I'm not in the company six months, and the chauffeur, ladder 38 chauffeur, gets hurt, and he has to go home. So now there's no driver for ladder 38. I'm working with Jack. Jack goes, you're driving me. So now I'm driving Uncle Jack. So a huge, huge milestone, right? And I'm I'm in front of you. As a kid, could you want anything more, right? So, um, So I was in ladder 38. Uh, we had a horrible fire that I remember. I, that, that one was um, was New Year's Eve. I think if I remember my notes, I think it was 19, um, 1980. Uh, I'm sorry, 1988. Uh, three kids took a Christmas tree down in the elevator at the same box, Monterey 180. It was two projects, and these uh, three kids, three, te- three teenagers took a Christmas tree in an elevator and they lit it off, joking around, not realizing. And so the elevator came down and uh, some people in the lobby said they just heard an explosion. And as um, we got there, yeah, there was uh, one kid, I I had the can, I had the can and uh, I ran up to him and I didn't even know what it was, Mike, to be honest with you, because all his clothes were completely burnt off. Black and singed. I thought it was, you know what I thought? It was like somebody took a shark, you know? It just like an oily skin, like uh, like a big fish, and they dropped it there, you know? And, and like like a prank. Uh, you, know, you don't know what's going on in your head, and it's, it's steaming. It's like I said, what's going on here, right? And so I look, and all of a sudden I could see the eyes and the mouth moving. I said, holy, it's a kid. It's a, it's a, it's a teenager. And I, you know, kind of wet him down, and, and we tell people they start throwing blankets down, and we cover the kid up. And uh, then there's another kid leaning on the side, and he he was burnt because he huddled himself, but he was burnt barely all the way down here. 
his, his shirt, and the top of his sneakers were completely burnt off, off him because he he uh, kind of blocked himself. And we were interviewing him, like, are you okay? You know, what, what else? And he said, he mentioned another name. I told the boss, there's a third kid someplace. The third kid was still in the elevator. Mm -hmm. That was a, a horrible, horrible, uh, there, there was New Year's Day, uh, I said 1988, something like that. Um, but yeah, so I was in ladder 30 for two years. Uh, they were all senior mentors, which was good. Again, you know, you're working with 20 fathers, uh, uh, but but then there were, us young guys were going in. Us young guys were transferring over. Brian Hickey, a great was a great friend of mine. I met Brian Hickey. He, Brian Hickey, there. He and I became good buddies. We painted the bunk room together. We had little paint businesses on the side. So Brian Hickey and I hit it off. We had a great time. And uh, he put me in that brothers in battle. The um, yes. He, so he has a little. I come out a little cameo in there. So he, he told me about it one day. He says, "Send me a picture of you." I said, "All right," and. You know, so I'm honored to be part of that uh, Brothers in Battle. Um, so I work with Brian, uh, uh, some other young guys. <clears throat> but what happened is they brought the Red Caps up into the area. And now the Red Caps is, is like, um, they're like fire marshal, the fire marshal, right? And they shut down the whole area. We everybody's around us going to fires. The lot of 38, we're not going to a crash can fire. We're not even going to a car fire. We're not, everything just shuts down. And we're like, <clears throat> what are we doing here? So um, Brian tells me he's going to go transfer to Rescue 4. And I said, you know what? I think um, I'm going to go. I'm going to look toward Brooklyn. I said, and my Uncle Jack at the time, he left. He, went, he got promoted, and he's out of the picture now. So um, <clears throat> we put transfer papers in. I looked to go to Brooklyn, and Brian, Hook, Brian Hickey has a place. Uh, he, he's going to go to uh, Rescue 4. And we almost went on the same order. We left ladder thirty eight, and uh, after two, I would have stayed at ladder thirty eight, but there was nothing going on. At that point, yeah, yeah. But you got in, you got into one twelve, and uh, you know you stayed there for about six years, eighty eight to ninety four. And then, of course, I'll get to ladder five a little bit later on. And you go from one borough of fire during those Bronx is burning years, Bronx bend years, to you know the the borough that's leading the city in fires because of its size. So you really can't go wrong. You know, you go from one chapter of it to another. And Brooklyn, again, you know, much like I talked about earlier with different cities and different flavors, each borough has its own flavor that makes it distinct. Absolutely. What's, what it is in Manhattan is different than what it is in the Bronx and what it is in Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island. So going out to Brooklyn, by that point, you got nine years in total in the fire service. You got six of them in the city of New York. Tell me about, you know, the what, how much of a change was it, if at all? Or did you feel like you hit the ground running in 112? Oh, no, you know, um, <clears throat> well, yes and no. There's two different two different fire departments. It's the New York City Fire Department and then the Brooklyn Fire Department. <laughs> okay? And everybody will tell you that. Right? I'm so proud Garrett didn't say it until you tell you. But the Brooklyn Fire Department, the, the guys, let, let me put it this way. In the Bronx, we call it the Gentleman's Fire Department. All right? So when a box comes out, like a box alarm, Engine 45, first do, engine 88, second do. Now, we don't try to beat each other in, okay? We'll turn a corner. If engine 45 is not there yet, we give them a second to come in, right? I mean, like for a vacant building fire or something like that. If it's occupied, you know, we're, we're, we're going to move along. But it's a lot of vacant buildings still in the Bronx at this point. But we're not going to try and jab these. Can I say? I can't say. We're going to try to cut each other off, right? And, and that's what happens. Like, you know, you, so in, like at your 45, we see them come down. We'll let them take their position and then we'll follow up. We're not trying to beat them in, okay? Brooklyn, forget about it. It's all hats and horns, okay? The, I was almost killed twice by rigs trying to blow the intersection. And I'm, I, I was on a rig because they're trying to cut us off going to an oil burner fire. So, um, but I wish I could combine them both because Brooklyn now, very aggressive guys. They want to go the gung ho, a lot of great spirit. They want to do things, okay? Um, the bosses, they want to get on the rigs and they want to tear it up. They want to get to the fire. They want to do whatever they're going to do. And I like that. I do like that idea. You know, I like going there, I like being aggressive. Uh, I mean, back in the Bronx, there was some times where, uh, you know, we turned out different bosses. We turned out like, let's go, let's go here. And it was frustrating sometimes. 
But in Brooklyn, boom, you were out, you were you were out the door. And so yeah, so I went to the ladder one twelve, and it's different. You have to kind of you know it's roll frames. Uh, in the Bronx was a lot of the apartment houses that we had. You had some roll frames, but Brooklyn is all roll frames. In fact, going from being a roof man in the Bronx was a pleasure going to, to Brooklyn because you're going. I had to run up how many times six stories to, to the on the apartment houses. When I got to the Bronx, the first time I rode, I went through three stories. I went, I shot out like a cannon. But I said, well, "Yeah, I'm on the roof already." But I like the roof job. I, I like like being a roof roof firefighter. But um, Brooklyn still had a grittiness. At the time when I left Ladder Thirty Eight, they were rebuilding. They were knocking down all the vacant buildings and they were rebuilding, put town hall townhouses up, like you see by eighty two and thirty one in in, a, in the Bronx. But Bushwick was like forgotten about so the the uh, crack epidemic was going on we had a ton of vacants out there occupied we had roll frames it was gritty it was gritty like i remember the bronx was and so i just fell right into uh, you know heaven uh, you know the, with, with the with the fire duty that we were doing we 112 is different that uh what's nice about 112 is that we're surrounded by all single engines so we have to run with all these single engines. So we are catching tons of work. In the Bronx, it's truck heavy. They got a lot of truck companies up there. Where Brooklyn is a little truck, um, not as heavy as it is more engine prevalent uh, out in Brooklyn. So we're doing a lot more running and a lot more work. And the work is fantastic. It's occupied work here and there, a little vacant. Um, I remember uh, one time we did the hat trick on one box. It, you know, we would go to we would go to fires like that. If you did a 24, 24 hour shift and you did three fires, we called it the hat trick, right? Because you did three fires. We did the hat trick on one box one time. I remember, right up the block from uh, on Knickerbocker Avenue, we had a top floor fire, and you know we do do whatever we have to do, and we come down after about an hour, and uh, we're all you know tired and. Um, the chauffeur goes, 112 is available. And they go, 112, you're available. Uh, we just got a report of a, um, a, a bodega right down the block from you. Bodega's wrong. We do, we do the bro bodega fire. So now we're whipped. We're, we, we, you know, we're, we're, we're done. This is like a 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. We're done. We're, we're just we're shot. We just, uh, the camera. Took a beating. Took a beating, you know, between. So, we're, okay. So we tell the chauffeur, let us go back R&R. &R, let us just go back, clean up, get the tools ready, have something to drink, and go, you know, not an hour. Just go back. On the way back, going down Putnam, all of a sudden, people in the street flagging us down. Like, wow, what? there's a fire up in the street. So, uh, same thing. We did it. So, we did three fires on one box. So, that was uh, that was kind of cool out there. Like that. But that was that was Bushwick. Bushwick was always something going on. It was They were hairy, some, some hairy fires because of those frames. Those frames take off. If you don't get those frames fast, they take off. And, and we had the dead man rooms. We had people, we would, um, you know, I'm not going to get it the whole time, but we had, it wasn't uncommon to have people jumping like that, you know. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of people impaled. But uh, it was, you know, because they had the roaring fences like that. Right. Yeah. You know, ugly. But I mean, there was always stuff like bizarro stuff going on in Brooklyn. And um, I loved it. It was just, you say, like, holy cow, I can't believe I'm, I'm doing this. I can't see what I'm seeing. But um, and, and it's repetitive as you keep doing your job and you're doing it many times, you just become good at it. You really do. You just know what's going on. You're thinking ahead. I mean, I would turn the corner and, you know, you was, we didn't even need the address, right? You turn the corner, you see the glow across the, the building, across the street like that. And you just, boom, you go into action. And the beauty about it was all the guys in Ladder 112, we were all the same age, Right. When I was in 38, there was sometimes I was working with guys that had almost 25 years on a job. And, uh, you know, we really didn't have nothing in common other than the fire service. It was fun when I worked with Brian Hickey because we were the same age. But now the whole crew, even the boss, I worked with Ed Kilduff. Ed Kilduff was my boss. Hmm. Um, yeah, he was my lieutenant. My my second tour down in 112, we got a job on Cornelia early in the morning. And uh, he's a lieutenant. He goes, he goes, uh, my second tour from, from the Bronx, he goes, uh, Danny says, I got the can. He says, hold that fire. The back, it's, it's, it's a railroad flat, so you get the back door, and the fire, flames are coming out of the back door, the burning of the back door. 
And he says, and we know there's a woman right above it. And, and the, of course, people seeing her up there. So he says, I'm going above. He says, you take care. Make sure that fire doesn't come out that door. And, and so I got two and a half gallons of water to go back there with this. And this is blowtorch. It just wants to come out. And you're just you're taking a beating in the hallway. You know what I mean? The heat, the it's high heat. And then like a sniper, I would go shoot the can and get back down. And all the while, I'm looking over my shoulder like, where's the line? Where's the hose line? And, and if you see the flames, like a bluish orange, you know, psh, give him another shot. And Chief Ed killed Duff. He makes a grab. He brings it down. He, so where do I work? 20 years in a fire department. My name's mentioned in a Medal Day book only one time. And I was for Ed killed Duff when he got his medal. So. <laughs> So, but it was I loved I loved one twelve. It was just it was gangbusters. It really was gangbusters, and it was a fun firehouse. Mike, again, if I'm talking too much, you just uh, no. This is this plug. is great. This is great. I want you to keep going. So, okay, so um, one twelve was the funniest firehouse. Now, if you had to you had to know what one twelve was all about, because I think you want to know about the ant farm and no frills, right? Yeah. Well, the so, story behind that, I imagine, is very okay. interesting. So. We call ourselves first originally the ant farm, right? So the firehouse is unique in itself because it's the rigs are parked front to back. Now it doesn't matter who's in the front uh, in the back. It just whoever comes back from runs, you know, and uh, to jockey the position. You always wanted to get the back because if during the night you didn't have a run, you'd have to move the rig. But uh, but we would front to back. It was a it was a firehouse that was designed for a single engine company. Okay. Uh, engine 277 and ladder 112. They each had their own single firehouse away, a block away from each other. And both firehouses were in the schoolyard. So the school school administration says, we want one of the firehouses out of the schoolyard. We don't care which one it is, but it has to go. So they take engine 277, they come to the ladder 112's quarters on Madison Street, and they back the rig in with the ladder truck. Six inches of the rig sticks out of the quarters. They say, not going to fit. Mm. So they take go around the Knickerbocker Avenue. Same thing. They get six inches to spare. They go, Knickerbocker Avenue is going to be ladder 112 and 277. And the fires on Madison Street, the next day gets burnt down for some reason. <laughs> but it gets burnt down. So that's how we became the ant farm. Uh, the fires were so close. It was, again, designed for a single engine company. But yet now, instead of having six guys there, there's 12 guys working in the firehouse. So the kitchen's a small galley. Guys are in there. And in the, the sitting room where we eat and watch TV, we have two tables that they sit back to back. So that if you're sitting in the middle between the two tables, you have to ask the guy to move so you can get out. That's how tight we're all in there. But the, um, the I'm trying to say the right word, the, uh, the teasing... You know, the 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 go the back and forth of uh, what goes on in you know we say in the kitchen they ball busting. It was it was so remarkable. I've never seen so. You didn't have to have thick skin. You had to have a tortoise shell because you were you were that close to each other. Now I'm going to tell you the difference. How I know this is the the best place. I've worked in. I, I was thinking tonight. I must have worked in 25 to 30 firehouses through details of, uh, in, in the um, in the city. But not one firehouse did I ever see a guy spaghetti come through his nose laughing so hard like that in, in a firehouse. And it was it was just the banter and the, the breaking of shoes on top of the fire duty. You couldn't ask for a better fire. So what happened was um, a fellow transferred into the ant farm, and he creates he he makes it the ant farm. He uh he realizes you know. He, he does he made a big mistake. He says the firehouse is too close, it's too tight. There's only one or two toilets for the for 12 guys, uh, one shower, uh, the bunk room, the beds all pushed together. And he, he the next day he's walking, he's pacing the floor. He's he's like losing color, he's losing you can see he's losing weight. He's just like, I gotta get it. So he got on the department phone and he says, and we hear him because everybody's together, you can hear him. And he's at the house watching, he goes, um, you got to get me out of this place. It's like an ant farm. Do whatever you got to do, but get me the hell out of here. And he slams down the phone. And we all, with an earshot, I'm going, that is going to be, of all the hero firemen that worked here, that guy's going to be remembered for calling this place the ant farm. And hence, we became the ant farm. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and it's so true. It was it was it was tight. Everybody was a tight on top, but everybody loved each other. We were all the same age. We were all doing what we wanted to do. When we used to go to fire, we knew there was a fire. We used to all put our hands over the engine compartment together, like that in unison, you know. And then we would break like that. But uh, and every guy covered his position. We uh, Ed Kilduff said um, uh, ladder one twelve was like a coal miners. A firehouse, right? The guys came to work with their lunch pails like coal miners. They went there, got their face dirty, ate their lunch, and went home. We didn't put in. For, we weren't allowed to put in for medals. We were not. We weren't put in for medals. Um, we just. We did a job. We didn't get unit citations. We just wanted to go to fires. Go home. The best houses. Uh, Those are the best houses. It was the best house. It was the best house. I've I've worked in. I've, I've worked in so many other ones, but um, just the camaraderie. The guys who want to go to fires. Tell you one more quick story. Sure, this right. was a fun story. So, um, I, I mean, I'm like, I could go on. I'm, I'm like a jukebox of stories. Uh, we get the bunker, we get the bunker gear. We, you know, finally coming in with bunker gear. And along the apparatus floor are all the boxes of bunker gear, right? They all have their boxes. And because we're all sized that they had a tailor come in and measure everybody out. So, uh, all the bunker gears and it's alongside, and I got I got mine finally. Right. But so what we said, and this is this is how we think because we we're nutty, stupid. <laughs> um, we said let's do this. So what we do, we take the biggest kind of firehouse and the smallest kind of fire, and in the front is their you know their names with the bunker gear, and we take one and the paper work that's on front, and we put it in each other guy's, you know, box. Like, you know, when he comes in, you, you see your bunker gear, right? We take the biggest guy, put it in the smallest guy. The smallest guy put it in his box, right? So you just see the names. And this is how God is good. This is God. God has a sense of humor. Here comes the same two guys coming to work that night together, coming in the firehouse. Now, you ever see, like, the cartoons where everybody's hiding behind the door, like, looking, <laughs> yeah. right? We're all behind the door, like, here they come, here they come. And one guy's trying to get, and the gear's hanging off, and the other guy's trying to he can't get his arm. What's going on here? What's going on here? Like, there was just a stupidity of things like that that we laughed so hard that I said, thank God we can't work more than 24 hours because my face hurt so bad and my stomach hurt so bad from laughing that I had I had to go home. And I right. swear, that's, that, that was a place in a nutshell. It was just cuckoo, crazy, all the time, nonstop. You know, and I think the camaraderie has increased tenfold because, as you said, those guys were the same age. There's camaraderie to begin with, obviously, if you're living with guys and gals yeah. for an extended period of time. You're going to get to know them, whether you want to or not. It's a different yeah. story, but you're going to. But when you're all the same age and you relatively have the same stuff in common outside the job, oh, forget about it. Yeah, you know? yeah. And it's a we beautiful will, thing when it meshes together like it did in 112. Yeah, because we'll have things in common. Who's doing Little League? Who's doing Cub Scouts? Who's playing, you know, uh, who's who, having a baby? Who's other guys having a baby? And we all have some things that, you know, share. Struggling. Struggling. We all own homes. We're struggling. Who's got side jobs? Things like that. So, yeah, it just it just really brought us all together like that. It was really That was really um, a solid, solid firehouse. What a, what a great bunch of guys. And when I transferred, you know, when we get to the line of fire, yeah, I sat in the parking lot. I cried. I said, I can't believe I'm doing this. Um, and I, yeah, I'm born. But I mean, I was so upset leaving, but I had to leave the firehouse. You know, why? But, Before I get to ladder five, why'd you have to leave? I moved. The Brentwood, uh, uh, the town wasn't doing too good, mm -hmm. so my son got uh, held up, and my son's bike got stolen. Um, he was having trouble at school with kids, uh, so I moved from Long Island. To upstate, a little bit up uh, West uh, Hudson Valley, uh, in Hudson Valley, and so doing that, the commute to Bushwick just wasn't going to, uh, you know, work out. So that's right. when I decided I have to do something, probably transfer to Manhattan. But uh, I could have done my whole career one twelve. I, I would have just loved doing there. I I drive in some of the guys. I, you know, I went to show for school. I was driving guys there, and it was just it was just you know. Always activity, oh, crazy, weird. We had another fire up on um, was it Merle Avenue, and it was we pull up and it was a garage, a, a garage or an, a vacant garage. So um, we pull up and right above the, the garage door, it's all it's all boarded up, but it's a, it's a small grate and it's all blood streaming down. We're like, and there's a little smoke coming out. We're like, what's going on here? So a guy pulls up and he says, uh, 
He says, there's a little fire. He said, but there's a guard dog in here. You got to be careful. There's a guard dog. And we went, okay. So again, I was with Ed Kilduff. Um, one guy had the, the can, I had the irons, and uh, we're at a gate. We're going to pull the gate up. The guy goes, there's a guard. Watch out. The guard dog. He's vicious. And so as we're going to flip the gate up, you know, the guy's going to hit the can, and I'll block the dog with the irons if, if I have to. We figure out. So we flip up the gate. There's a, there's a, a body burning right in front of us. She was caught in between the group. They were free basing. And so when it, when it lit off the, this, they were up in a lounge. The guy jumped out the window, split his hand open, caught it. And this woman, she tried to run out with her clothes on fire, and she got stuck between the doors. And it, oh. it's just weird, 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 crazy stuff. But uh, anyway, you know, I don't mean to go on that, but it was just crazy stuff. You go, oh, my God. Yeah. Right. You never know what you're going to see in a given shift. I mean, especially you don't know. You, you, think, you think it's just, you know, okay, we got a little smoke thing. But, it, you know, things just don't, don't start adding up the right way. But anyway, right. but right. I love that. I love that. I could go on with one twelve story, man. I tell you, I I can go on. There was <laughs> plenty of them. You know, it's it's interesting because if you look at the evolution of your career, you started off, of course, like I said, counting New York City and no, not Washington. Mm -hmm. You started off in the Bronx, obviously, and you went to Bushwick, and then of course, you know, after the Bronx in Brooklyn, nineteen ninety four, you go to Ladder Five of Manhattan, and given the neighborhoods where you worked in, you part of you, you know, if I'm not mistaken here, must have went. You know, looking around Greenwich Village at Ladder Five, huh? Like, where am I? You know, at night. Talk about night and day. It's like two different cities. It's two different worlds. You're absolutely right. Um, yeah, it's 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 way different. Um, but I like the charge of Manhattan. I always thought, you know, uh, visiting Manhattan was always had a unique vibe to it. Um, so at the time. I was going through, a, you know, I, I moved moved upstairs. I was going through a divorce too, so uh, I said, "Well, you know, I, I've been working in the, the Bushwick in the South Bronx. I said, I just need a change. I says, I want something to, to do that's going to be fun. I said, I just want to have some fun for, for, for a little while." And I said, "What? What would be?" I says, "You know what? I says the the uh, every kid being a fireman wants to drive the back of a ladder truck, right?" I says. I want to be that kid. If I'm going to, if I'm going to spend some time, I still have the availability. I can do it. So I searched out. Uh, I wasn't going to drive to Manhattan because of you know, you know commuting to Manhattan is, is impossible. I said, but I'm going to take the train in, and I'm going to find a firehouse along somewhere along easy train routes so that I can you know be able to get in and out. But as the firehouse has to have a tiller. I want to go. I want to learn how to tiller. So. Through, you know, deduction, going through and all, a uh, ladder five, a ladder five popped up. I said, you know, I'll transfer the ladder five. So uh, that was right. I transferred there right after um, the Watch Street fire. Mm. <clears throat> At that time, the Watch Street fire, you had uh, Jimmy Young, Chris Edenberg, and John Drennan. John Drennan had just passed away in May. I got the firehouse in June of that year. I got transferred from ladder 112, and then um, I, I went to – you know, ladder five. I said, all right. I said, just, you know, charge, recharge my batteries a little bit. You know, um, it's different. Like, again, you get high rise buildings. There's a, there's a whole plethora of different type of, of buildings in there. You have subways, you have the water, um, high rise, you have uh, renovations, you have rear tenements. There's a ton of different things like that. But there's a vibe. There's a, there's a real vibe of um, in Manhattan. So um, I transferred ladder five. And um, I'm in my glory. I, you know, it's kind of fun. It's it's unique. Um, we're not doing a fire duty that I was used to and things like that. A lot of fires not noted for you know heavy fire duty. I said, but it's you know it's a nice fire. We're doing different emergency work. We do subway work. We do you know car accidents and uh, people in the water. Uh, I said subway right, man under. We do yeah, man under, like which that. is not fun. No, no, we're doing those things. Uh, and so um, elevator emergencies, of course, duck fires, what else? But, so, but I'm tillering. I said, I'm having fun tillering. I'm back there tillering. And uh, the only guy that has picture taken more than me in a tiller seat was the mounted cop. And I know you like that. But uh, the mounted cops would walk by, and everybody's camera would go from me to them, you know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but tillering in Soho, Greenwich Village, that was, that was a, a really remarkable place. And Soho is... It's so exciting. Uh, 
at the time it wasn't it wasn't popular as it was now. It was almost a lot of it was a ghost town. It had the you know, cast iron buildings, but it wasn't um, the big uh, businesses didn't move in at that time. Yet they were coming. Yeah. I, I remember them putting a Harry Potter place up there on Broadway. I said Harry Potter, who, who's that, right? But um, yeah, so Tillin, Tillin through Greenwich Village, and I don't care where we're going, as long as we're out. I was Tillin having fun. I said, this is pretty cool. So I was in the company for about six months, seven months, and now I'm getting to the urge. I, I want to get back. I, I'm missing a fire dude like that. And I, so when the train comes down, when I take Metro North, it stops at 125th Street, and then it comes into Grand Central. Off 125th Street, one block down is 14 truck. Uh, middle of Harlem. I says, you know, I could I could walk there and uh, you know go to 14 truck and go to Harlem, and go to Harlem Flies. So I tell her, I, I drive these two bosses, um, Mike Wakola, beautiful man, and uh, JJ JJ Johnson. And I I, I tell him, I says, uh, <clears throat> I says, I like it here, but I says I'm missing the fly day. I think I'm going to go back. I say, I says I'm looking up the line. I think I'm going to go to 14 truck. And uh, JJ Johnson, the lieutenant, goes, no, no, if you stay here. Um, we're going to give you the seat. We're going to give you, you know, you become the ladder chauffeur. I'm like, oh, yeah. I said, uh, so that means no details for me. That means when I come to work, I, you know, I, I drive the truck all the time. And I said, I'll take it. I said, that, that sounds good to me. So, um, so I stayed there. I stayed almost six, seven years at, at Ladder 5 as a ladder company chauffeur for them. And um, I liked it. I, I, I recharged my batteries. It got me studying. I started studying. Um, but it is, it's a different, you know, it's, it's a different type of firehouse. Um, I always say, I say there's two types of firefighters. There's the, uh, the there's the race horse and there's the grace horse, the horse, like the grays. Right. And, and when you go into the, um, the busy, busy companies, like the fire duty companies, they're all race horses. These guys just want to go. They, they don't want to stop. They, they want to go. But when you start getting to other firehouse, you got guys that are there. Okay, I don't care. You know, they, they want to collect a check, then they're there. And then you have your other, you know, uh, racehorse guys. And, and they kind of come and then they go. And then you get another racehorse guy and they come and go. So yeah, it's a little bit of that going, goes back and forth. And even in the bosses, you get the bosses there. They come for a while, then they want to go back. And so um, so it's a little different type of fire department in, in that regard, too. So I'm not working with all the racehorses anymore, I'm working with two guys. <laughs> um, but the bosses, the two bosses I worked with with Ladder Five was was Mike Wakola and uh, JJ Johnson. Uh, JJ went on to become a captain, and then I got Vinny Giamona, uh, and they both Vinny and uh, Mike Wakola they died at nine eleven. Right. But uh, yeah, because if you want to get there, we'll get the stories later on about that. But um, yeah, so it was it was fun being a ladder show for you. You're the you're the go to guy. I become a senior man, you know. Uh, there was another senior man in the company, but guys come up, they respect you, they ask you, you work with the probies, you talk to them, you make sure they, they know the assignments, you walk through with them. You're not the officer, but you're the in-between guy, right? So they don't feel threatened with you. And, and what I used to do is I wash, the, you know, when I wash the, the rug, I always wash the rig. I was, uh, when I come in, I wanted the rig to be clean and spotless. And um, and then some, I, the spring and the fall, I used to wax it. Not the whole lot of truck at a time. I would take parts of it, but um, but you know I would pull the ladders out on Saturday. Anyway, I would talk to the probies, uh, position the ladders, all the parts of ladders, and you train them. You kind of go through it. Think where would you use this ladder mostly, and and things like that. Uh, using the ladder pipe, we use the ladder pipe. Um, I know there was a story about ladder thirty using, but we used it before that because I was training on it. I was studying, and we would set the ladder pipe up, and that was a lost heart lost art evolution when the towel ladders came in. Nobody used to use a ladder pipe, but I was studying. I said, no, we're going to set up the ladder pipe. And we wound up using it up in Midtown one time. Uh, you know, and uh, but, it, you know, it was fun. It was, it was good. I had a great time there. Uh, I met my wife down there, and, and so I started living in Battery Park with her. And, I mean, I had it. It was gravy. It was uh, I would use, walk to the firehouse. On nice days, I could walk to the firehouse, and and she'd meet me after work, and we go to uh, you know some place to eat after work. So I, I just love living in Manhattan. It was that was it was a it was pretty much glorious time. Oh, yeah. I would say so. And that's yeah. the 
interesting thing about it to your point earlier about talking about the businesses and whatnot, because you were there, there was a great evolution, a great renaissance in the city, you know, throughout the five boroughs, of course, but particularly in Manhattan in the mid nineties. And you got to see that in real time from what it was when you first got there in 1994. Okay. We're starting to turn a corner by 1999, by 2000. Wow. Not only have we turned the corner, we've gone all the way down the street. We're on to the next couple of blocks. You know, so it's an interesting evolution for the city. And it's funny you mentioned the man under jobs because you ask any emergency service unit cop or any fireman, that's the job that they most hate working, obviously, for, you know, because it's just messy and it's not fun. And I remember talking with a friend of mine who was in the transit police who's a rescue unit pre-merge, yeah. John Cushing. And he was saying, you know, we actually got along great with the fire department because nobody wanted to do what we were doing when it came to that. Yeah. No, it, it's, that started to change. Um, in the beginning, uh, I can't speak about Manhattan and the man under stuff, but um, in the beginning when the Hearst tools started coming around, right? Um, fire companies were uh, fighting or, you know, going back and forth with the police over uh, pin jobs and things like that. I just never saw the, I never saw the, the point of all that. You're like, if you're there first, you got, you got the job. If we're there first, you, we got the job. But, you know, the, I, I heard cops shutting down our, our Hearst tools, uh, and, and you know, and guys getting arguing, getting in the face. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't. We we need to work together. That, that was all about that. But yeah, we um, we, I, I, we worked a lot with the Port Authority cops because um, the funny thing is, we'd be in front of the firehouse on Sixth Avenue, and we would see Port Authority come out of the Holland Tunnel, race up Sixth Avenue, and we're going, they're going to a man on the job, and uh, that was up on Christopher Street. Four or five minutes later, we get toned up, you know, and we were up there we were working on it. But, yeah, it's, you know, it's, they're doing their thing. We're doing it. And, and, you know, you got guys that love what they're doing in the PD, and God bless them. And we do what we do. But, you know, we got to be able to, uh, you know, work together. And I, I started seeing that. I started seeing that more so like that. And, uh, yeah. FEMA yeah. helped a lot. The search and rescue task force you, where you put them both on the same team, that helped a lot because when they started seeing each other on jobs after that, they were like, hey, yeah. you know, because they knew each other. And yeah, like, yeah. And OEM, OEM became, or, yep. uh, that, that started coming in like that. And then was, they started saying, look, you got to stop playing together, playing the right way, you know. And, and the funny thing is because um, we would see uh, the first, let's say, the first bombing of uh, the World Trade Center in 93. Yeah. Now, the cops had every toy you can imagine that was set up. And we were still using ropes and plastic bags in a, in a chalkboard. We were so far behind things like that. So, uh, you know, it, it got to a point where we elevated and we really, you know, became uh, as proficient in, in, in our command structure like that. It, it took a little while, but it was identified and corrected. But, um, yeah, like to your point, you know, things started to change. We got the, we got... We finally got bunker gear that uh, guys wanted to wear. You know, I right. wasn't so crazy about it. It was, it was. I think the bunker gear is great for engine companies, but um, for a lot of companies, it's kind of tough. Uh, I think they ought to be able to modify the gear for for firefighters because um, it, it's a struggle for like the, the truck guys. Our, our truck operations, a lot of guys, you know, like are on the roof or their uh, their the outside vent guys, they hop in fences in the back, they're moving around, so. Wearing bunker gear is very cumbersome, um, and now you see some of the rescue companies they're wearing like a like a light type of rescue gear, it, you know, it, because uh, firefighting gear isn't disabled for everything, right? right. There, there's certain things if you're doing high angle stuff like that, you don't need it. The gear gets in your way; it's it's too cumbersome. I remember Howard Saver telling me a few weeks ago when he was on the show saying, you know, when he first became fire commissioner, he was saying, I didn't want to bring the FDNY into the 21st century. I just wanted to get them into the 20th century. That's true. That's true. <laughs> and That's in those true. two years, he did some good things, and he was able to before he became the police commissioner. But you he know, was, and, I, I watched your interview with him, and God bless him. Yes, he brought he brought a, he brought the fax machines into the fire department. He got he got us the bunker gear after you know we lost some guy, but he computers and yeah, because we used to do everything was typed on carpet paper. Remember carpet paper? You had to get yeah, carpet paper. God. And, and that was oh, how you guys did that. Oh, God. <laughs> but, you know, it's, oh, forget about it. But the car put the carbon paper in there, and then, and then if the car, you try to use the carbon paper, I'll put it upside down. So you, oh, my God. But oh, my I, I, kudos to Howard Safe. If he's watching, kudos to you. And uh, I met him. I met him one time uh, when he first came in because he said he was circling the firehouses. 
Right. And I yeah. was I was detailed up to um, a 40 truck that night, and he, he came in there, and I shook his hand. But the little time he was on, yeah, he was good. He was good like that. He was um, he, he was sharp in that regard. Um, and it was, that was a great interview that you did with him. That was good. Well, was thank good. you. And I think I think he's kind of misunderstood. He's not. I mean, I understand he's a very serious guy, and particularly yeah. I saw that when he was the police yeah. commissioner. But he's not a mean yeah. guy at all. Nice guy. Well, that's what you find out. You know, firemen are funny because you know, you got, as soon as you become a commissioner, you're bad. Right, because you, you're working on the other side, you know, you're working right. for the mayor and things like that. <laughs> but th th you got to understand the commission is not to be your friend, he's trying to do the best he can do, you know, for the um, you know, for the fire department. And and we had a business guy, he was a businessman that came out. And and see, here's another difference a lot of times, uh, police commissioners are appointed because they have a real strong police background, okay. A lot of times, fire commissioners are appointed as favors. Right in the, in the political system, they so, you know, I'll make you the fire commissioner, and that's what happened. And sometimes you, you don't get the guy with a real background in the in the farm. And and I'm saying the fire firemen are the best. I, you know, commissioners. I mean, look at again, look at Safer. I think for a short time, Safer was there. He did yeah. a pretty good job. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Yeah. So you know, getting back to your career, summer of 2001, before that day, you were bouncing around. 82 in the Bronx. And it was, you know, I wonder, and of course, ladder 10, ladder 15, but just a quick note on 82. The engine 82 of, let's say, May, June 2001, was it any different uh, from the engine 82 of, let's say, the 1970s? Dennis, oh, but they're obviously the 70s. I mean, listen, it was a different era. The city had yeah. changed a lot. Oh, yeah. But in terms of fire duty and volume, call oh, yeah. volume, yeah. same or a lot different? Oh, no, no. Night and day, you know, okay. apples or oranges. Uh, Back then, you know, you, if anybody read the book, they were running, you know. But now you have more. Now, I didn't go to Engine 82. I went to Ladder 31. Okay. I thought you went back to 82. You were telling me you were in 82. Were, the fire house, 82 and 31. Ah. But, but I went to the Ladder 31. So that was my other milestone now. Mm -hmm. Now I go back to where I started as a kid, to Ladder 31. All right? So what happens is uh, I'm at Ladder 5, and I, um, now I'm studying a little bit, right? And... <clears throat> I want to um, I want to sharpen my tools again. You know, being in a show firm, you kind of you know forcing doors all the time, doing things like that. You kind of like uh, the the free safety in the background, helping guys out. But I want to get back into the into the, the fire duty, the fire activity, and so I was studying, and uh, I said, you know what? I said um, I, I need to just kind of be hands on again. I need to kind of get out of my comfort zone, break out. You're comfortably numb. I need to break that out. I said, but where would I go? Where would I go back to? So uh, I, I was sitting I said, you know what? I'm going to go back to where it all started for me. And I transferred back to Ladder 31. Now, I, st I still live in Battery Park, but I got a little commute. But it's not that bad. I said, uh, <coughs> I'll go back to Ladder 31. And so I transferred to Ladder 31. And I'm back to doing forcing doors and, you know, bulkheads on a roof. I'm back to being a hands off fireman. And I'm studying, and um, but uh, engine eighty two. Uh, what's going on then is um, they're doing all the a lot of EMS at this time now. It's all EMS runs, and they're doing EMS runs, and we're we're catching a little bit of fire, but it's nothing like uh, it used to be at, at that point. Uh, I caught a couple of jobs with them, nice job, get in there, do a search, kick doors down, it's things that I I like to do. I haven't done them in six seven years. And then I feel good again. I feel like okay, I'm back into it. I, you know, and um, and so so that was good. That was um, back to ladder thirty one, which was a milestone. And then the topper is just before I get. We'll go into that in a second. I drive ladder thirty one. I'm detailed uh, again. Ladder forty two is in a firehouse. They're doing renovation at the time, so right. I'm doing a lot of details. I'm driving ladder forty two a lot. But uh, they go, um, they tell me, and they said, oh, Dan, uh, we have to send a guy back downtown. He says, because of manpower issues. And this is this is like, um, what, end of August, or August of 2001. They said, uh, I got 19 years on the job. I'm, I'm, I'm actually the senior man of the firehouse, even though I transferred. Senior man at, as time on a job, but not in the fire. But, but uh, they said, you know, you don't have to take the detail. There's another kid that's supposed to take the detail. 
But uh, if you take the detail, you know, we appreciate it. You live down there. I just say no more. It's, just, it's good for me, too, because the lieutenant's test is coming in October. So I said, send me the ladder, ladder 10. I says, ladder 10 virtually shuts down after 6 o'clock because everybody goes home. And it's almost no runs. You know, it's very quiet. I could walk again from my apartment to the ladder 10's firehouse. I could study. It's all about studying right now. I get as much studying as I can. And so uh, they said, okay. They said, oh, by the way, uh, you're Mike Chauvetin. You drive ladder 31. So now I just touched them all, Mike, you know. I went through driving Jack and all. Now, from where I originally started from, as a kid, riding in the front seat, a ladder 31, I'm driving it tonight. And uh, to me, that was that was more than any reward, any compensation I could ever have, is I was in the seat. And I drove the, you know, once or twice. But it was, it was a, a remarkable, you know, touch all the bases. And uh, like when Aaron Judd ran around the bases, right. that was me. That was me that morning. Right. So. Now, of course. And, it, you know, especially for someone like yourself who was a student and is a student of the fire service, it is, I imagine it meant even more to you knowing yeah. the history of that house and growing up basically in that house, it coming of huge. age in that house. The history, the, the house, I like working with the guys and get to know some of the guys. Right. But when I went back there, it was about the house. It was about the history of the house. It was the huge, it was the house just ooze the history and the things that i remember in that house was still there a lot of things weren't changed at the time and so going back there like that was just it was phenomenal i it was almost like ghost mike i could see guys there i can remember guys over here i can remember kitchen kitchen conversations so it was almost like going back to a, a ghost it was almost like back to the future at that time i can't explain the feeling but it was wonderful and then I got detailed down to uh, 10 and 10, and I started the detail um, September 8th, I believe, mm -hmm. 2001. And then came that day, and you were right there, you know, and you were telling me the story off the air, and, it, you know, we'll touch on it on the air. Just, you know, it's it's been discussed so many times in my police interviews, obviously, in my FDNY interviews as well, that um, – you really can't even begin to quantify. You really can't even begin to put into words. But you hear Louie talk about it a lot and getting salty. Guy went left, he lived. The guy went right, sure. he died. You know, so after that, and then you're looking at the list, and there's so many names, guys you worked with, guys you knew, or guys that you knew of. Yeah. Was there a part of you that said, you know, the survivor's guilt of it, right? How the heck am I still here? It, I, I didn't have survivor's guilt, Mike. Um, it just wasn't my time. I don't say, you know, people say you were blessed. I wasn't blessed. The 343 and the other people, they were blessed. They were they were, they were God, you know. They were blessed. They were taken. Um, no, I was just, I, you know, for nothing more, I was just lucky uh, at that. I, it was just wasn't my time. I don't have an answer. I can't give you a cliche answer for that. Um, I was with Pete Beerfield in 10 and 10's quarters. Uh, as we dressed together, go out and then cross the street, um, Captain Paul Mallory told me, you know, stop, I'm going to give you a Halligan tool. And then um, I stopped, and I, I grabbed that, and Pete kept going. Um, Pete died. Um, uh, my my fate, leaving ladder five. I just, for some reason, leave, leaving ladder five, when I transferred to ladder third, that was my whole crew. The two bosses I drove, uh, Michael Cole and Vinnie Giamona, and my whole crew. They were my groups. That they were all killed. I I would my mutual partner was killed. So had I still stayed in line of five, I would have been on that rig. You know, I mean, I I didn't go home early. I would just been there and um, so yeah, it was it was left left or right, a second here, second there, and that's that's how it was. It was, but I wouldn't say I, I would never use the word blessed because um, I was just lucky. It was just wasn't my time. And same thing for my wife. My wife was on the eighty first floor. Right, and a plane hit right above her head, and uh, she was, you know, she was just lucky. Um, you know, the blessed were the ones that went to heaven. You know, uh, above her when they when she came down from the eighty first floor, there was nobody behind them. And they were like the last evacuees coming down, and uh, and, and um, you know, she she was uh, she she was coming down, and they they turned around back. And she just cleared remarkably. 
when she got down to the um, to the ground floor, it took them. I mean, uh, I forget how many minutes, but by the time they they ran through the the uh, the um, the mall down below, and they came up by the Borders Bookstore, which is further off. That's when she thought she was safe, and then the South Tower came down, and the South Tower came down all around her. So we were just, you know, it wasn't our time. I, I can't explain otherwise. You know, I remember having this conversation with Joe Connor, who worked down in Manhattan, and not as a fireman, but uh, he worked in the financial industry. Uh, and his family's been touched by terrorism. And that was a great episode. If you want to check it out for those of you in the chat back in April. And I remember just asking him, you know, how was your 2002? How was your 2003? Because you saw that mental tug of war, particularly for that area of the city, the whole city, obviously, but that area of the city where the towers once were, where people were kind of walking around in 02 and 03. And it's just, it's, it's awkward and it's, it's painful. But it's awkward just to look and not see them there anymore, just to look at faces that you probably saw just a few months before, the vendor here, the fireman there, the cop here that aren't around anymore. It takes a while to come to terms and say, yeah, that happened. Wow, I'm not going to see this person again. Oh, yeah, they were there that day. They perished. You know, and then came your retirement in August of 02. Before that, just the mental tug of war alone, eliminating for a second the grief of losing the whole crew. What was what was your 2002 like just from that standpoint alone? Well, I mean, there were 60 guys that I knew very well. Now, um, again, I'll just touch on Mike Wakola and Vinnie Jumor. I They were my two bosses when I drove Ladder 5. So when you're in the front seat of the ladder, ladder truck like that, you really start to bond. You talk about things, and you, you get together. And that's where my, um, you know, I'm building inspections. I, the guys would get off the rig, and I would sit with Mike Wakola, and we would talk. And you really got close. You really became, you know, good friends. Uh, Vinny Giamona. Now, I mentioned I do my little writings. I call it Glory Days. Right, and this which comes I love. From, this comes from Vinny Giamona. So uh, one day we, we backed in after a restaurant far on 11th Street. And it was a beautiful morning. The sun was coming up over the, over the buildings. And as I backed the ladder truck in, Vinny just sat there. And he said, you know, Danny, um, these are our glory days. I said, you're right, Vinny. You're, you're absolutely right. And who would know a couple months later on his 40th birthday, which was 9-11, he gets killed. Yeah. But um, So that's where my glory days come. It's a tribute to him, rem remembrance of him. But, yeah, losing 60 guys, there were three guys in Gene's um, business that were killed, uh, three people from home. Well, we, we, our home got uh, destroyed. We, had a, we were homeless for, for some, some weeks. But our neighborhood was destroyed. It was funny. I was just reading something about West Street. I was reading an article about West Street. Um, they just finished West Street August of 2001. All the work and construction from battery, from the battery all up to 59th Street. West Street was just done with all the construction. And two weeks later, it's, it's all just blown up. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that's my neighborhood. That's where I, for the last two years I was growing up. And we always used to go out and visit people and we'd come home. And we would see the, the tower. We'd go, oh, the towers, that's home. We'll be home soon. And the, just see those, you know, majestical towers destroyed and gone and crumbled. It's just a hole. There's still a hole there. And, you know, I'm not going to get into it. But, uh, you know, what they put down there, it's okay. It's, but it's not, it's, to me, it's, it's never going to be the same. It's not, it's not going to be. Can things ever be the same? Probably right. not. Do we have to move on? I agree. But to me, it's, it's just still unsettling. Uh, don't say don't again. Don't have a survivor's grief, but uh, we loved living down there, and we we had to move out, and that was something. Jean loved her job, uh, and she, I mean she was doing so well. She worked for Bank of America. She loves her boss. She loves her friends. But the job was gone. The job was gone after that. Um, I got injured down there, and uh, but I love I love uh, you know being a fireman. They told me you got to go. I says, but uh, they said nope. And they, I said, can I get to August 6th? They go, August 6th, and then you're gone. And so I got to August 6th, and I was gone. And uh, so, yeah, but, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, the heartache is still for the, I still think, I, you know, for the, for the, for the children, the, the children that, uh, you know, lost parents that were down there, that, that, that bugs me. That, I mean, that irks me. To, and they grown. We, we, you know, we coddle, not coddle, we, uh, we, we used to send gift packages to Vinnie's, you know, children and other children, things like that. Now they're all young people. They're all up there in their 20s, right? It's 20, 
21 years plus now. So uh, they've grown, they're up. And they, a lot of these people have moved on, but for us, it's still a heartache. It's, it's still um, it's an upsetting day because it's it, it does it doesn't end. The day is still there. You always yeah. you always think about the day, um, and it's still fresh in in our hearts and in our minds. Like we don't dwell on it, don't get sick of it, but there's a stress when nine eleven starts coming up that we start thinking about the friends that we knew and the people that we knew and uh, the jobs that we had, where we lived, our lifestyle, yep. uh, and the people that are not as fortunate as us. Yep. And those that have gotten sick since then and passed and away. From, and, and that, Mike, we're, we're approaching the three over 300 right now, guys. Yeah. That I know, I, Mike Toll, I, I from Twenty Truck, and these other guys. I could go on and list a list a bunch of guys that are just you know, are beautiful guys. They're just passing too early in their lives, right? They they have, a, yeah. they should be enjoying every time. This is you know they're they're my age now, right? And they they they're dying and and every. Uh, I used to always read the department orders, and every other one now is is a, is a beautiful face that's uh, succumbing to the uh, to the you know to the, uh, the 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 air qualities and, and the sickness from uh, 911. It just and it's just, the heartache just keeps moving forward, right? Right. You know, and then you see the children, you see the young, you know, children that they have, and uh, their grandfather. And it just it still affects people. It really is. It's really sad. Of course. Before I get to your writing and Glory Days and, of course, the book you have coming up, Stu Kelsaw's had this question in the chat for a while, and I promised Stu at the right time I'd get to it. Before that day, let's, you know, June, July 2001, um, if you were sitting around the firehouse during that rare moment of downtime, Stu wants to know, towards the end of your career, were there any changes to the job, right? Firemen hate change. That's the old saying you're Kevin Goob, but throw around right jokingly that you didn't like or agree with. Well, what do they say in the fire department, right? We've got 100 years of tradition impeded by change, right? Yeah. Half the, half the firemen uh, like the way things are. The other half don't like the, don't like the, um, uh, don't like the change or uh, improve things, right? Right. No. Um, I, I, no, nothing bothered me. I, I kind of went with the flow. Like, we introduced a bunk of gear and, and things like that. No, it, you know, the fire department evolves. If you think about it, we were Back with the horses and uh, the false alarm. It's, so interviewing Vinnie Dunn, which uh, I love, and hats off to He's the grand pool bar of firefighters. I asked him a similar type question. He goes, you know what, Dan? He goes, it's trends. We go through trends, what we're used to, right? So I'll give you for example. When he started the the, uh, the CFR, right, the engines run to all these emergency calls and uh, emergency responses. Right. So I didn't, but I mean, because, you know, we didn't touch on it, but I worked for EMS, like with Garrett. But, uh, you know, I didn't mind on EMS runs and stuff like that. And, and But these other guys, you know, they're running up all these EMS calls. And so there's some grumbling about that. But now you get the new guys coming on, right? And the new guys, I interviewed a guy for the book, and he said, um, I love going on these EMS calls, right? He says, because I really feel like I'm helping people. So it's all trends. So we go from trends. We go from uh, from the backstep era, uh, getting in line, and wearing a mask. Back then, guys didn't wear the mask. Right now, they got to wear a mask. They ride inside the cab. Then the bunker gear. So the fire department is always evolving. It's alive. It's always evolved, and these are trends. And then, not, and now guys are on their cell phones. It's okay. I mean, you know, I'm used. To, I, I always back then on 9/11, nobody had cell phones. Nobody had cell phones in the fires. But this is what goes on the firehouse now. Guys wear cell, they do their cell phones. It, it's not my thing, but this is what these guys are doing. I, and I'm not going to comment on it. That's this is their life. This is their fire department now. It, it evolves. The fire department evolves. It's a living thing, and so. Yeah, you just have to go with the flow because you can't fight it. And now with your writing, you know, I see the glories they post all the time on Facebook and I love it. And I, I really do dig your style of writing. It's so honest. It really puts you, especially when you throw the photos in there, really makes you feel like you're actually there and living it. That's what um, you got to do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it really appeals to uh, yeah. the psyche of one that's reading it. And now you're putting it together for this book. Now, of course, I can't wait for the book to come out. A lot of people in the chat have mentioned the same thing, but it's one thing to get the idea 
it's another thing to put it into action. So tell me about, okay, when the idea spawned and successfully, as you have been doing to this point, putting it into action to where it's on that pace, it's going to get finished, and it'll be out soon. Okay, so two thoughts here. The first thought is, now, when I write on my Facebook page, okay, yep. I just chronologically list my career, mm-hmm. all right? That's not the book. Right. That's not going to be the Different book. Different thing, as we know. Yeah. Okay, right. I just, what I wanted to do is, um, speaking about my Facebook page, the glory days that I put on there, and I, I have over almost a year and a half of a story. I put a, I put a story out every Sunday, uh, but I sit and I think about, a certain topic, and I keep I keep a, a notebook. And when I think of something, a pop up in my head, immediately I write it down. And then I did this all, you know. So this is over two years. And then, as you as you know, you compile right. Each sentence makes a paragraph, a paragraph, and all of a sudden you start to compile. And as soon as it, I mean, nine times out of ten, I'm in the shower and a thought pops in my head, and I'm dripping wet, and I sneak out, so I write, and I'm dripping in my book. But you got to capture that thought right there and then. And you'd be surprised how, you know, if you kept doing that, and you sit back and you think, at the wall, you know, you, you come out with some pretty good stories that you remember. So that's what I do on my Facebook page. And I, I just, I started my times with the with the volunteer fire department we talked about, my EMS states that I call the gory days, right, in East New York. Uh, my my time in DC to uh, do the FD and Y and so on and so forth, and I, I it's just for me it's, it's it's fun writing, you know like um, people like to do crossword puzzles right? right? I like to put a story together. I can't just bang that story out in an hour. It takes me four or five days, right? And then I find pictures that go along, like you said. But it takes me for, to get the right words and try to capture, think that, go back. Oh, that's a better thought to put that in. And that's what I do. So that's what I do. I don't watch a whole lot of television, but I like to put those stories in. So accordingly, Glenn Usden had saw the way I write my my stories. And um, we we had just gone to, he not him, but I went to Charlie McCarthy, one of the legends of Ladder 31 that I used to ride with his funeral that was in Slopesburg, New York. And it was a group picture taken of the guys from that era sitting at a picnic table together. And I, I always thought I was there. I saw them. I talked to them. But um, fella um, Smokey, Zeke, Charlie Zeke, he takes their picture and they po- he posts it on their Facebook. But um, Glenn Osden, now he's a professional photographer. And he's outrageously good that I found out. But he reached out to me. I didn't know Glenn from anywhere. So he reached out to me. He says, uh, "Would you? Would you think? What would you think about capturing these guys' stories and uh, writing a bio of them? And I'll take their picture." I said, "This is right up, right up my alley. I'm I'm all into this." I said, "This is this will be a great thing to do, you know, um, because like I mentioned to you before, you know, with the leapfrog, these are these are tactics that." the fire department doesn't do anymore. And what these guys saw and what these guys did back then is you're never going to see that again. In that time, that era, the way the, the way the South Bronx, you know, became, you're never going to see that again. You know, they'll be running, but you'll never see that type of um, uh, poverty, that type of situation, that type of um, neglect ever happening in a, in, a, in a, you know, in a city. It's going to be bad, bad things, but that was just accumulation of numerous things that just came together with Austin and then everything else uh, during the South Bronx time. But they all had great stories. And so we started targeting those guys. And I spoke to Glenn and says, well, you know, there are more guys. There, there, are, other, there are other great stories out there. Um, and so leading into this book, I said, yeah, I'd be willing to, you know, put a list of guys together and start putting um, names. And, and I'll interview them if you want to take their, their photos. And he said, that's what we'll do. So Glenn lives, he's a, he's a chief, he's a volunteer chief in uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And um, so we started with the guys from the Warriors, from 8231, uh, the, the, the Willie Knapps and, uh, and, and the um, uh, Nick Carpentano, uh, uh, I'm drawing a blank, Eddie Penner and... Um, the ILP's in there. 
Well, we, we got to Lee L, uh, ILP later on, but we, we you know, we, we just wound up getting, uh, you know, Valenzano brothers out there. We, we started getting Lou Andre, uh, Tom Simmons, Tom Kennedy. All these guys were legends during the war years, a lot of 31 and so forth. And Joe T. Bonanno, you know, and I don't want to mention, you know, I mean, there's so many names. We started capturing stories and we said, you know, there's more. And we just, we just went on and on. So we targeted 60 names. We wound up with 90. And and every I've I couldn't ask uh, an easier way of doing this, Mike. I couldn't I couldn't have planned it any better. I have um, some of the we have four chief of departments. We have a commissioner. We have uh, uh, um, guys from the ceremonial unit. How the ceremonial was created. How hazmat one was created. We have Nozlemen that were on uh, the Atlantic Avenue fire, on the um, the Astoria fire, Father's Day fire. Uh, first, per we had a lot of first person accounts, and it just morphed into that. I couldn't plan anything better than it. Just it was like, by God, you know, it just led with that I collected. Well, you have the first uh, woman battalion chief, the first woman that ever received a uh, a. a Fire Department medal. Um, it just it just went on and on, Mike, and it just came naturally and easy. We did ninety ninety one. We got Lee Ielpi in there. We did Garrett. Garrett, I saw him there. yeah, I love Garrett. Uh, what was that guy's name? Mike Milner, Milner, Mike. <laughs> Mil yeah, we got Mike <laughs> Milner in there. Him. Yeah, never heard of him. We got Mike <laughs> Milner and his great story. I love Mike. I had a great time, and that yeah. was a part of it. The fun of it, Mike, was interviewing these guys, right? I remember, enjoy. you know, now I never met Mike before, but we sat, I could have stayed all day with Mike, right? And uh, there were so many other guys that I just had a, we had a real blast that uh, interviewing uh, sharp guys and even the new guys. Some of the new guys, again, I tell you, I, I interviewed um, Connor McCaffrey. Um, he's going to be a legend someday in the fire department. He's over 54 engine, <laughs> loves doing EMS work. He was the first guy there when the helicopter crashed into one of the high rise. He was a nozzle man up there. Uh, Paul Hashhagen with his stories. We we have, you, you know, what it is I didn't. We didn't just get the best home run, run hitters. We got the best fielders of every position, and we've got the, some of the best bosses. We got uh, bosses and and how they rebuilt the FDNY after nine eleven. I can't tell you, Mike. Uh, you know. The insight of how they rebuilt the FDNY after 9 11, after so de decimated, and then the sock companies. And we have first person accounts like that. And Glenn's pictures, let me tell you something. His, his pictures are so exciting that they're so crisp, they're, they're so unique. He took a picture of Willie Knapp, his hands. And you talk about pictures, they tell a story. You know, a picture of is what, worth a thousand words? Yeah. Forget about it. You take a picture of this guy and you look at it and then you see his face and you say, this guy crawled out of this many holes. You know, it's unbelievable, Mike. And so, again, I'm just blessed. I was in the right place, right time. It's fun writing these stories. Um, and uh, and Glenn's working on the book now. So um, to Mike's question, he asked earlier, uh, it's being laid out. So there's a process of laying it all out. Everything's been completed. We got. We went down. Glenn flew down to Florida to, to interview Lee, Lee Ielpi, great, beautiful man, and uh, Garrett Lindgren. You know, we got him down there, and we were supposed to do Dennis Smith. Dennis Smith was a big proponent, a big. Uh, he wanted to be really a part of the project, and you know, sadly he passed away. But um, yeah, we just got some real uh, Bob Farrell. We, I mean, I could go on, but it's it's a book of who's who's and. Let me say, in all fairness, we just touched, touched the tip of the iceberg. We could have gone on and on. And, uh, we, you know, we started off with 60. We went up with 90. I could have easily gone way over that. But we said we got to draw a line someplace. But um, the stories, the stories are, are really captivating and uh, and really honest and earnest. And some funny stories, too, uh, from the heart. And some, some good stories in there, you know. John Albanese has the question. Could you please ask Dan if there's any FTNY dispatchers in the book? Uh, yes. Okay. We'll leave it at that. We'll leave yes. it at that. Yep. Who, <laughs> no who does he like? Who does he like? 
That's a good question, John. Put who you like. Are you a Warren Fuchs guy? Or are you a Jimmy Rafferty Bingo. guy? Oh, okay. There you go, Warren. Fuchs. I, I remember, remember Rescue too. They let him. You know, he he would. And I remember reading this in the Last Man Out uh, by Ray Downey's nephew Tom. He would be riding in the back of the rig. This was during the talk about the glory days, and he'd know the routes by heart. He, whoever the chauffeur was, left, right. Oh yeah. Down. He he wasn't even looking. He just knew. You know? But you do. You, know, you you grow up in a, in a neighborhood and you know, things like that. And you just, yeah, I mean, there were certain guys like that. Just knew. Now, I'll tell you another guy, and he's in a book, and I'll tell you, Ronnie Caratu. He grew up in Brooklyn as a little kid, and he wound up being uh, the command of Ladder 112. Now, he didn't, just, he didn't just know the streets. He knew who was living on the streets. You know? <laughs> so he, he, he's got a great story. I, I, I tell you, it's just... Mike, I couldn't plan this out. If I said we wanted to do this, I could not plan this out. It was just, it's providence. It's from above. It's just, and it just came. It's just getting their messages out. It's all about their messages. And again, I could have gone on to so many guys. Uh, I wish I could have got more guys. But the book would have been 1,200 guys. There's so many great guys, you know. So I don't right. mean, you know, you know, that um, cutting anybody out or anything like that. But, uh, you know, it was it was it was a fun fun project. It took us uh, about fourteen months to do the whole the whole book, and so we're hoping to it comes out uh, pre orders around in November. It should be available. It, it will be available, Clint, only by Christmas. Mm -hmm. So and then we'll go. work out some you know if they want to do book I don't know, book signs or whatever like that. But uh, you know, it's about getting the book. Yeah, how's that, Mike? Is that is your question, Mike. All right. <laughs> I think it does. I think it does, Mr. Milliner's and mine's by extension. Well, this episode has been an instant classic. It's been a great volume 30 of the best of the bravest. And uh, it is now time for the rapid fire. Five hit and run questions from me, five hit and run answers from you. Of course, you could say pass if you want. Are you ready? Yeah, go ahead. Now, you mentioned the Hearst tool, and the Hearst tool is great. ESU cops love it, firemen love it. It's a great tool. Besides that, though, favorite tool on the rig, if you have them, the hook. All right, there you go. Classic Engerman oh, answer. Engerman, truckman. And, and truck, well, the truckman, sorry. You know, so. Everybody everybody should be carrying a hook. There's, there's so much you can do with it when you're, provide, when you're holding the door back. If you're you know, forcing the door, you're going to hook the door, hold the door. But let me tell you something. You wanted to talk about, we won't get into time, maybe no time, mm -hmm. of ventilation and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. Now, you see these guys, they all run off to the roof. They want to cut right away. They want to cut the roof, you know. But you give me a guy with a good hook, knows how to work a hook, he can go inside, he can pull a 10 by 10 ceiling down in, in, in 30 seconds. You know, so the advantage of the hook of getting underneath the fire and pulling things apart and put and opening exposures and then opening walls, the hook is a phenomenal tool. It's 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 overlooked, but it's it's the most classic tool. Every truck you should have one. Everybody should, you know, on, on a rig, two or three guys should have the hook uh in a hand with, with something else. But um the hook by far one of the best tools. Second run up to that was the duck bill. The duck bill is a long pointed iron tool that fits between the hasp of the lock. You'll see a guy cutting there. Uh, we used to get taxpayers on White Plains Road all the time, and we would have the duck bill. And I could do boom, boom. I could hit it with the back of a maul. It would, would pry down and would force the hasp of the lock away from the lock. And you could go down and roll. By the time the guy cuts one lock, I could do three or four. Of those with, with the duck bill. So I'm going to say my answer is with the hook and a duck bill. How's that? There you go. Truck man. I meant to say truck man. I got truck man. Sure I truck that. man. <laughs> Come on, Mike. <laughs> Again, that's why I don't pay me the big bucks. Second, besides, you know, we talked about, of course, the man under jobs, which are not fun. But besides fires, favorite non fire emergency to go to where you know, okay, we're going to do some good work here. So I was thinking about that. I, I, I don't know. Non fire. I like going to fires. Um, that's the reason why I, I, I turned down. I turned down rescue two. I re turned down rescue four. I turned down rescue two in uh, in Washington D.C. Uh, I just like going to fires. I just why I want to go to fire. But um, let's see. So um, non fires. Um, uh, I don't know. Let me see. Let me. What did I? Let me just, give me one second. Let me just because I knew that question was coming up and. Uh, I said, let me see. Uh, what would I rapid fire? Okay. Well, I'll give you. Uh, how about I just give an example of one that was kind of fun? All right. Sure. 
So a lot of five, we get called for a guy stuck in a tree, right? This is Greenwich Village typical, okay? And so we pull up, and now there's a guy stuck in a tree. And he's up in a tree, and I take the aerial, and I start threading it through, you know, getting up there. And we go up, and we catch the, you know, get the guy. What are you doing up here? And there's a, I'm trying to get my bird. My bird's over here. So we take him down, and uh, he goes, now, can you, can you go get a bird? <laughs> my boss goes, no, no. We don't do birds, you know. <laughs> so, so that was that was a typical of a uh, non. I mean, you know, go to Waterloo. Nothing ever bothered me. You know, go to Waterloo. Just we're there for you know anything. You want to call call the fire? We're there for anything. It doesn't matter. But um, non fire emergencies. Uh, I just took it with a grain. I I don't have a favorite. So. Yeah, listen, all good work as long as you can. Do it's, it's all, but save my bird was good. Uh, I, I'll give you one more quick one. I'll give you one more okay. fun one. No Same thing, Greenwich Village with Mike Walcola. Mike Walcola had a dark sense of humor. He was, he was gripping. Um, we have a tree down across Hudson, Hudson uh, Street. And, uh, you know, there's all these people, save my tree, save my tree, right? So we have to, you know, they want to cut the, you know, we have to cut the tree. It's, it's down, it's cross. And they're all, you know, they're all complaining about cutting the tree. So we cut the tree down. So I go, I whisper into the ice, I says, uh, why don't you order all the rest of the trees on the block to be cut down? Right, and you want to see? He goes, cut all the rest of these trees down. You want to see? We caused a riot, Mike. We all jumped on the rig and we bolted out of it. The people were ready to throw things at us. So anyway, uh, yeah. So I, it's just having fun. But um, yeah. All right, give me your next one. Well, you kind of hit on some of them, but I guess I can still ask the question anyway because there might be another good one. Funniest call you ever responded to? How about a funniest non-call? There you go. That's good. Too. All right, saving saving fireman Paul. So again, ladder five. We had uh, Paul. Uh, Paul Keating lived used to live down next to Ten's Quarters. Paul died at nine eleven. But okay, so I got Vinny Giamone. Vinny Giamone is the coolest cat in the world. He's he's relaxed. No, nothing bothers. Nothing ever irks him. He's all about the job and doing things. Okay, but Paul's in his crawl. Paul. Uh, Paul's been abusing getting in at nine o'clock. Paul's been running tardy lately. And that's uh, got Vinny a little angry. So this Sunday morning, Paul doesn't show up at nine o'clock in the firehouse, and would, would you know calls you know Paul Paul you know. So Vinny, Lieutenant Vinny, says, "Danny, get on a truck. We're taking a run down to Liberty Street." Okay, so we go <laughs> lights and sirens out, allegedly uh, down down West Street. We're passing now. This is weekend morning, right? Uh, weekday, weekend morning. So all the guys in ladder ten are out on an apron talking and things. Now here we come, responding past them with ladder five, and they all look like, "What did we miss a run? Do we, you know?" And you can see them all looking perplexed and like confused. And we pull about four doors away from where Paul lives, and one of the guys says, "That's Paul's window up there." So now I put the the aerial up to Paul's window. Right now, all the guys in ladder ten looking like, what's going on here? What you know? And they they, they want to come down. They don't know what's going on. And we just we get out. This is all stealth, right? All uh, under undercover. We put the ladder up, and one of the guys, Greg the seat, goes up and bangs on the window. This is the beauty of it all. The window opens up, and there goes Paul. Sticks his hand and goes, "Oh, I'm supposed to work today." And really, <laughs> the coolest guy in the world goes, "Get down here!" And Paul goes. Do I have time to shave? I, I took everything to hold Vinny back from running up the ladder to throttle. <laughs> so yeah, so that would have to be my favorite call of all time. You know. Oh God. So, yeah. All fourth, right. Fourth favorite bar or restaurant in New York oh, City. Okay. So the favorite bar that I always liked was Milano's. Milano's goes back to the 1800s. Have you ever heard of it? Yeah. You heard of it? Never been, but I, I've heard of it. What'd you hear about it? Well, I've heard there's it's an interesting spot. Say the okay, least. so history. it's a small, small bar, right? Mm -hmm. It's 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 on it's on uh, Houston Street and just uh, just um, east of Broadway. Mm -hmm. But it's a small bar. It's probably got a dozen chairs up along the bar, and then in the back, it's so small. It's only got like three or four tables with two chairs on it. That's all it. And if you're sitting at the uh, sitting at the bar, the people have to squeeze by you to get to, to whatever the bathroom. So I love that bar. That was a nice, you know. Quite tight little, and I said to myself, the day I retire, 
I'm going to throw the party in that bar, right? So that mm-hmm. if 10 guys come, I fill the joint up. <laughs> I'd be like, I look like a star, right? Mm-hmm. So that I loved, I love Milano. I, I used to, that was my favorite bar. In there. That was a, a tiny, it's still there, a tiny small bar. And I said, if I can get 10 guys to come to a retirement party, it'd be like, I filled the room. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, my favorite restaurant mm-hmm. would have to be, um, I like the oyster bar that used to be in the Grand Central. Mm-hmm. There was nothing, they had the best. Um, uh, what do you call it? Um, clams, uh, and what else? Um, so clams, but they had the best martinis too. So I used to get some clams and martinis, like, you know, like that. And I think the other best restaurant I always enjoyed, but I mean, when Gene and I lived in Manhattan, mm-hmm. we had all these restaurants. We used to go to Greenwich Village. There was, there was a ton of, of great restaurants. We've been to Sparks and all the, all the uh, different. Um, you know, famous restaurants and things like that. But the other place I really like was Katz's Deli. Ah, yeah, it's classic. Kat, Katz's Deli is a classic place, you know. And if you haven't had a pastrami there, you don't know what you're missing. That was a that was a great place, Katz's Deli. Down there. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then uh, fifth and finally, if you can grab somebody that's coming on the job now, rookie in the city, what would you yeah. tell him or her? Well, I would say, you know. You have to, when you go to the firehouse, nobody's watching you, but all eyes are on you, right? Guys are, you know, they're not going to say anything, but all eyes are on you. So you want to be first up. You want to be first, you know, the last sitting down like that. So, uh, but um, the other thing is read something fire related every day. When you're in the firehouse, take something out. And fire, because I'll tell you what, I thought I was a good fireman. I became a much better fireman after I really started reading the book, starting for lieutenant. Because I would go to fire and say, how did that lieutenant know that? And when I started reading the books, they were, I started, it started really filling in the blanks. So let me tell you something. The, the guys, whether you're going to go for promotion or not, read the books or read something fire-related all the time, okay? Um, and the, the final thing I would say is step up. If you're going to do something... Step up and don't cut corners. If you're going to run a Super Bowl pool or if you're going to do the dishes or whatever you're going to do, you step up or you're going to run a party, don't cut corners. You always want to do everything the best. Err on a better better side than being cheap or, or, cook, or cut corners. Be the best. Be the best you can be. That's about it. How about that? Yeah. I think it sounds good. And I think, like I said earlier, this episode is an instant classic. This is one of the top episodes I've done. How about uh, that? And I didn't even, you can count on one hand the amount of words I said tonight, which is even better because I've said this many a time. I don't like do, yeah, yeah. I don't like doing a lot of talking. If the guest is doing most of the talking, then that means we're having a good show. Uh, so. I can, uh, I'm a jukebox, jukebox <laughs> of stories, please. I can oh. see that. I can oh, see man. that. So before I say goodbye to the audience, we'll say goodbye off the air, of course. Is there any shout outs to anyone or anything you want to give? No, just to the brothers, be safe, you know, know your job. Um, to the guys that I interviewed for the book and Mike Miller, the guys, and, you know, thank you so much for your cooperation and being part of it. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mike. I mean, you, you, you got some great big hitters on here. I, I'm so honored to be a uh, part of your, uh, part, part of your collection and um, just be safe, be safe out there. Be careful. This is a different world, a strange world out there. Things have changed, right? They used to throw bricks and rocks at us. Um, they're doing bad things now to, to other, you know, we just, uh, we had the Lieutenant from the EMS yeah. that would die, you know, these, these are strange, these are strange happenings right now. So you got to protect yourself, be on guard, be careful, go home safe. Always remember, take care of your brother, watch your brother's back. Thank you very much, everybody that tuned in tonight. For those of you that had questions I didn't get to, I apologize. Just so many great stories are being told tonight. I didn't have time to get to everything, but bear with me on that front. Uh, so coming up next on the Mike New Haven podcast, two really interesting shows. First, it's going to be my first Q&A show. It's going to be volume 31 of The Best of the Bravest. That's this Monday at 6 p.m. Hank Malay and Ray Seeley will rejoin me. And Brian Keller, too, who's a frequent uh, member in the chat there, uh, former volunteer fireman himself, 17-year veteran. He'll be my special guest producer for that night. We'll be taking questions from you. You have my email in the description of this video. Either email me questions or come with some good ones that night in the chat. And we get back to the E-Men inside the NYPD's Emergency Service Unit on Tuesday. Ray Ruiz, he worked 
16 years in emergency service in order. Truck two first in Harlem, then truck three in the South Bronx, then truck four in the North Bronx. So that should be an interesting volume 22 with him. In the meantime, on behalf of Dan Potter and Paul Perricone, because this week, like I said earlier, we hit two milestones. So shout out to Paul for Tales from the Boom Room. Shout out to Dan tonight for the best of the bravest. I'm Mike Colon, and we will see you next time. See you Monday. Have a great weekend, everybody. Be safe. Thank you.